Championship Wrestling. Bringing you great wrestling action. Sanctioned by the NWA, National Wrestling Alliance. But first, NWA World Championship Wrestling. NWA World Championship Wrestling from November 7th, 1987. Show opened with clips of the Road Warriors destroying some geeks. And if you've been listening to this show for a month or so, you realize what usually happens here is they show clips of an angle, and it's a tease, and they show the rest of the angle later, or the match, or whatever's happening. Yes. Here was the Road Warriors destroyed some geeks, and they said, see the Road Warriors in a town near you, and it was never spoken of again. Yeah, they're just plugging the local events. All of them, yeah. at once. Yeah, why not? Ricky Santana and his suit joined the announcers for a promo. He talked about Starcade. He said Dusty Rhodes would beat Lex Luger. He said Ronnie Garvin would beat Ric Flair. And then, as best I can tell, he repeated the entire promo in Spanish and left. You know, as soon as Ricky Santana targeted Ric Flair, I, I knew nothing good could come of this. Strategic error. Oh, my God. Was it ever? There were some good promos on this show. One in particular. Yes. We'll get to it. Boy, will we get to it. New Breed versus Rex King and Robbie Idol. Sloppy, but David Crockett was barking out for it. Yeah, this was weird. I think the New Breed are now baby faces. Yes. It seems clear. I mean, the fans love them. David Crockett loves them. But still, they did the deal where Champion had a pin at one point, but he pulled the guy up at two, which is definitely a heel move. Yeah. I think he pulled him up at two so that he could deliver a drop kick, which the fans wanted. Well... Here's the whole the thing. thing is bizarre. They're baby faces, but they're terrible at it. They pull the guy up at two. Yeah, are they good at anything? They're not the. Uh, <laughs> I don't hate them as much as I hate some. I don't them. hate them. Yeah. But the question remains: Are they good? Their matches are not especially good. <laughs> are they good Their at anything? Promos are not especially good. No. Their gear is not especially good. No. There's nothing about them that's good, but they're not horrible. They're no. not terrible. No. They're just solidly below average. <laughs> So, they are the story of the future. David Crockett loves them. Oh, that's a good point, actually. David Crockett loves them, and they were having a good laugh trying to get him to pop, and eventually they won with a rockerplex. Ric Flair came out. Oh, man. He was mad. The very first thing he said is the fans are ready for a real man after the way this show opened up. Yes. At first, I thought he was talking about the new breed. Then I remembered he's talking about Ricky Santana. I could tell he was pissed, and I thought he'd be pissed at Garvin, or Dusty Rhodes, or Ricky Morton. No. He is outraged that, in his words, a minority like Ricky Santana. He says, Ricky Santana, the minority that he is. <laughs> Send hate mail to Ric Flair, not us. We hey, I'm a minority. We are merely reporting what, what went down. He, was, he, he essentially warned Ricky, keep my name out of your mouth. He says, you're wearing your fake diamonds. Yes. He goes, you need a lot more than that to be a big time. Mm -hmm. Ran down the new breed as well. Said they were out there in their mother's underwear thinking they were ready to wrestle, and that was an insult to him. He was on fire. Moved on to Ronnie Garvin. Ran him down for a while. Says he put over all the talent at Starcade and said, Thanksgiving night, there's no choice to make. For your money, you should tune into Starcade. Because you see... The World Wrestling Federation said, hey, let's do our own pay-per-view Thanksgiving night. And so Starcade 87 was going head-to-head -head on pay-per-view with the inaugural Survivor Series event. Well, incorrect. All right. The idea was it would go head-to-head, -head, but by the time the day came, there were five cable companies. Not like, you know, big cable companies. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about your local cable company, your local office. Yeah. There were five cities in America. That carried Starcade. Oops. Yeah. So, fans didn't have a choice. Mm. Unless they were in those five cities. He also promised they would take New York over. Kevin Sullivan versus David Isley. Have you ever noticed what a sad sick, sadistic man David Crockett is? No, because I love seeing dudes beat the shit out of each other, too. Kevin Sullivan's going to destroy another one, he says with glee. Hey, when I watch this show, I'm begging for something like this. Some of these boring-ass squash matches. At least Sullivan came out here and beat the shit out of this there guy. There were no arm bars here. No, and he didn't hurt the guy. He just beat the shit out he of him. He just gave him a beating. Yeah. Beat him, for, beat him up for three minutes and pinned him with a foot stomp. And it was weird because we have asked the question repeatedly. 
Is Sullivan a babyface or is he a heel? I believe last week on this very show we concluded he's a heel. Wrong! The way they're doing commentary, he's a babyface. How? I don't know. He... Short, ugly, violent men are not often babyfaces. No, and he's, his goddamn promos. I, I turned so heel on Kevin Sullivan on this show, as we'll get to. Starcade Control Center report. Then he stole two finishes. He stole the punch to the head and the double foot stomp, the standing double foot stomp. Anything else, dude? Starcade Control Center report. Okay, here's a problem with this company now. I feel like we've been building a Starcade for like three months. There's still two weeks to go. They had nothing new to add. They just ran down the card and said, hey, after this, we have the bunk- bunkhouse stampede to look forward to. And that was it. Well, Vinny, you see, the problem is back in the day, you got the card weeks in advance mm-hmm. because that's how you sold tickets. Yeah. And then all you could do was keep plugging it if there were any tickets left and try to sell the pay-per-view. Now, WWE waits till the very last minute to do the final matches. Yes. Sometimes we don't even get the whole card until the day of the show. Sure. So you've grown up in an era where every week they got to add a little bit of stuff. This was just a different era. This was the way they did things. They could have done something here. They could have had somebody cut a promo. They could have had... Or they, shown they, highlights of something. Sure. Yeah. But I don't have a problem with them having the card well in advance. And oh, just no. ramming it down our throats. So that's a good thing. We've been watching the Retro Nitros when they would often have perhaps a main event book for the pay-per-view. Or we didn't it. even know what the goddamn main event was, the, 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 the go-home show. Yes. Like that last show, Hall and Goldberg, they told us the the go-home show, like at the end of the show. Yes. Sting versus Tommy Angel. Cut to a shot of a lovely young lady in the crowd. David Crockett, we got some good-looking fans. Dude, he was a creep this evening. There was a lot more to come. I actually got significantly pervier later. Yes. So Sting did a horrible dropkick. Something something that might have been a powerbomb. The thing with Sting was... I could never call him terrible, but he was very green, Sure, and some of the things he did were, in fact, terrible. Yes. But overall, he wasn't terrible. No. He was just a green guy. This fucking dropkick was terrible. Yes. And over the course of the next, what, 30 years, it got a little better? (laughs) His dropkick and his top rope splash, never his best moves. No. No. But he didn't give up. (laughs) He stuck with them. Somewhere in here, Crockett starts plugging the Nikita Koloff, Terry Taylor match, and just says... Nikita's going to massacre that preppy. <laughs> Sting won here with the Stinger Splash. It was okay. It was fine. I could not bury this. Midnight Express versus Bob Emery and Joe Lynn. You know what the theme of the show was? I really started to figure out in this match. The theme of this show, it was like somebody backstage said, you know what? Last week's show was fucking boring. So everybody, give something to the jobbers. Because Every match on this show, the jobbers, at least for a while, got heat on the stars. They got something. And it was hilarious in some cases. <laughs> like, sometimes it was... This one here was, the two jobbers are working over the Express early. And then, what is the number one rule of tag team wrestling? Cut off two, the ring. Two men beat up one. And no, one man, no, like if it's real. I see. Cut off the ring. Yes. Right? Yeah. This fucking jobber's beating on Bob Eaton, and he just walks him right over to Eaton's corner. And Stan Lane tagged in, and they beat the shit out of this guy. Eaton looked at him for a second, and he tagged in Stan, and said, well, since we're here, we'll just kill you now. Yep. And then later, Eaton was like, ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> Let's give him one more thing. So he goes and lets his buddy tag in, and he beats the shit out of him. Then they won. It was funny at first, because I'm honestly not sure which, but one of these jobbers was big. A big, scary-looking guy. So it made sense that he would give this guy some offense because he was big and scary looking. It fit. And then he tags in the skinny dude with the mustache. And that guy ran wild. And then I was just confused. I love Stan's random karate. Mm-hmm. Every now and then he just does karate. Karate. So they won with the rocket launcher. And then Cornette cuts a promo. No, no, no. No, no. During the rocket launcher, Cornette's outside. And he sees Eaton start to come off the top. And so he raises both of his arms in the air to celebrate. Yes, that's right. But his goddamn tennis racket is right in front of the camera, blocking every moment of Bob Eaton's finish. Now, normally, Cornette is, like, so good at talking that he always gets the last word. He always one-ups the announcers. This is the one time they've got him. 
he had his fucking tennis racket in the way. They are so happy to be able to bury him for putting his tennis racket in the way of his man's finish. They play it again. They're howling at his stupidity. Cornette was speechless. It was great. So then there's two cards right now. They're playing very hard. Starcade, of course. And then they have a uh, show the prior night at the NASA Coliseum in New York and Long Island. So throughout this promo, I was very confused. But by the end, uh, it was actually Lex made it very clear. But uh, it's Wednesday night, NASA Coliseum, Thursday night, Starcade in Chicago. Wednesday night is War Games. And then Midnight Express are in it. It's the Midnight's, Big Bubba, and I think Tully and Arn, if I have that right. I believe so. Against the Rock and Roll Express, uh, Ronnie Garvin, and I think the Road Warriors. I ain't seen this damn show, so I don't care. That's true. I'm not going to New York. Yeah. I'm waiting for Starcade. So they plug that match, and then they plug the But I drive to match. San Jose to get one of the cable companies that actually has it on the West Coast. That's right. And they plug the scaffold match, the Rock and Rolls, the uh, Starcade, and tried to push them off, and that was that. Ron Garvin versus Alan Martin. May I? What the fuck took so long? This guy came out and looked like the world champion. He came out here and he beat the holy living fuck out of Alan Martin. He chopped the shit out of him. He squeezed his belly fat. He hit the double foot stomp. He chopped the shit out of him. He gave him a wedge. He kneed him in the ass. He chopped him some more. He was chopping and chopping. He Garvin stomp. And then after he Garvin stomps all the way around his body... He stomps and stands on his face for the pin. Yes. What took so long? I don't know what to tell you. This was what this guy was doing a year ago. Yeah. Where I was saying, you know what? What's everyone's problem with Ron Garvin as a champion? Well, what happened was he won the goddamn title. He didn't do this, and he cut shitty promos. What were they waiting for? Finally, I got a world championship performance out of Ronnie Garvin here. Did you mention where before the match he gave his towel and a kiss to a little old lady on the floor? That's right. Handed his belt to uh, Teddy Long, in fact, and beat the hell out of this guy and pinned him with a Garvin stomp. Nikita Koloff came out for a promo and ran down Terry Taylor, and this is probably the best example of what I was talking about. Have these men been feuding for all of 1987 now? Probably. It feels that way. Like, I'm, I'm sick of the feud, and they haven't actually wrestled yet. Dude, they started the Ron Garvin and Ric Flair feud a year and a half before they did the title change. That one at least had chapters. Things did happen along sure. the way. This one, like a month ago, seriously a month ago, they stole Nikita's belt, and then they just gave it back to him, and now they just keep talking to each other. I gotta say one more thing about that Garvin match. Forget me loving the match. These fans were so into him beating the shit out of this man. They reacted to Ron Garvin, for once, like he was, in fact, the world champion. There was a, a specific group of fans in the front row, five or six of them, and they looked like the kind of guys who would usually be the Horseman fans. Maybe they were, but they got you know, caught up in the action. Grown young men, they were all wearing sunglasses inside, but they loved all the baby faces here. Nikita talked about what great fans they were. I'm sure these are the guys who are getting on uh, Dick Murdoch's case later. Flair referenced them, too. They were, they were rabid all night. Lex Luger came out for a promo. You know how many times on this show they'll have a person out there, like some guy, and they try and cut to the women to show like how much they love this guy, and the women are like either bored or disgusted? Mm -hmm. Not tonight. No, no. These women went nuts when this man took his shirt off. Lust in their eyes. Holy smokes. He, all, all, all ages, all, all races, all women loved Lex Luger. Yes. So he's hyping up the New York show. He talks about all the big stars that are going to be on there. It's Flair and Rose and the Road Warriors and the Rock and Roll Express and the Midnight Express. But the biggest star of all is going to be Lex Luger. Pulls off his shirt and this physique. And he flexes. And everyone cheers. And the next day, of course, a star cage when he's going to... At, at Starcade, Tully and Arn are going to beat the uh, Road Warriors. Flair's going to beat Garvin. And then most of all, I'm going to end Dusty Rose's career. And then me and the Horsemen are going to go party and tear Chicago limb from limb. That was a good promo. Man, this guy was on fire here tonight. Yeah. Hiro Matsuda versus Rocky King. And by the way, when he was done, they cut to one final woman. Mm -hmm. her, her jaw's just hanging open. Oh, yeah. He her was a specimen. Mouth was agape. Mm-hmm. 
Hero Matsuda versus Rocky King. Hero once again, no no knee pads, no boots, just like you know, like the, the, like the like the buffest grandpa you ever saw in his underwear pretending to fight. He's an old nude guy. Yeah, and he's throwing some he threw some stiff chops and some horrible kicks and a bunch of nerve pinches, and then the Oriental sleeper. Yes, he put Rocky King away. And he did wake the man up afterwards to ensure... It was very nice of him. He did not die. He was, he was very sporting here. Yeah, he was Every, very sporting. He was aggressive, but everything he did was very 100% within the rules. He won with a clean hold, and after the match was done, he did all he could to ensure the safety of his opponent. Can he put Dusty out before Starcade? So that story is still going on, yes. So Sullivan's back. He turned heel and face like six times over the course of this promo. He's upset that Ricky Santana is calling out Flair. He's also upset Lex Luger thinks he has a chance to beat Dusty Rhodes. Says so Dusty was a great pro rodeo rider and a pro football player. A professional rodeo rider. That poor cow. That wasn't even his bullshit story ever that I can think of. He said Lex was the only horseman who had anything to lose. I, I don't know why. The crowd was silent listening to him. Just rambled they, on forever. I don't know if they were sucks. bored or if they were into it, but... Eventually, he wrapped, him, he, he wrapped himself up quickly. So they must have been frantically waving at him to take it home. And finally, he just said, Lex is in trouble. And he goes away. Ricky Santana versus Rick Ryder. This. So apparently last year on Valentine's Day. Ah, Valentine's Day, okay. Tony Schiavone must have handed out roses to all of the older ladies or something like that. I think it was couples and their anniversary. Something like that. Yeah. So David Crockett is so excited during this match. And it ain't about the match, I can tell you that much. He says, Tony, why don't you tell everybody what you're going to be doing this year? And Tony's like, you know, trying not to get a divorce. So he's just very quiet. <laughs> and David says, come on, tell him. You're going to be handing out roses this year to all the girls who turn 21. They turn into be women. That's exactly what he said. They turn into be women. That's what he said. And I, I, as excited as I tried to be when I first said it, I did not even approach David Crockett. He was so excited that Tony was handing out roses to all of the very young women who just turned 21 and are now women. Apparently on their birthday. Yes. Tony is taken completely off guard. He just tries to move on. He was very embarrassed. You I tell. was embarrassed. The only thing I mentioned in the match is that Ricky at one point suplexed Rick Ryder right on the back of his neck. Should have just pinned him. It looked like he was dead. Why not just pin the guy? I, I don't know. Why did Rick Ryder kick out? Eventually, Ricky Santana won with a body press. It was weird. Sting came out for a promo. Okay, this was the greatest promo of the night before the greatest promo of the night came later. Mm -hmm. But it was absolutely no good. <laughs> but it was a promo that everybody must see. You know what this is? This is raw if you, if you just cut everybody loose. And they don't know what they're doing. They've never, they've never just had to go out there and improvise. It's live, and you either sink or swim. If it were raw, they would have scripted some for them. They would have done 30 takes or whatever. They would have chose the least shitty one. They would have put it on the air. And we never would have gotten this. That would have been a tragedy. This guy's fucking out of his mind. He has a few things that he's got to say. But also, he's got to make sure that he's constantly screaming at the fans. <laughs> Woo! Whatever his deal is. What else did he say? It was more than just wooing. First he talked about how hot he was. Then he said, ow! That's right. He says, my temperature ain't 98.6. It's 104 degrees. And I feel really good. <laughs> it's it's like, you should be in the hospital right now. <laughs> he said the announcers might melt. He was so hot. So you got the team with Jimmy Garvin and Michael Hayes. And they're crazy like me. They're rebels like me. They'll fight to the death just like me. Yes. Then he screamed at the fans he again. Screamed, ah, whoo, ah. And the fans are screaming back, and they cut to a wide shot. And Tony is supposed to wrap it up. And as he starts to speak, Sting just gives one more scream. And Tony gives up, and he drops the mic. He looks at the camera, and he waves goodbye, and they fade to black. This had to have been the craziest interview in the history of this show. <laughs> I'm counting like Jimmy Valiant. Oh, yeah. I'm counting all these guys. <laughs> he's, he's out of his mind. Oh, yeah. And he throws in the line... I'm going to fly high that night. Woo! I'm going to go crazy. Woo! They cut to Tony, and he's just like... 
See you, fans. <laughs> this is awesome in every way. This was... I don't care what you say. The greatest promo of Sting's career. It was amazing. It was fucking terrible. <laughs> no. But it was awesome. It was great. I will, I will not have you disparage this promo. <laughs> Finny, it was terrible. <laughs> Come on But now. it was awesome. I will say... The very word awesome. <laughs> It did have. It inspired such awe. I was in when awe. I watched it. It was in. Awe, I was in awe of it. And I will say that later in the show, Jimmy Garvin pointed out, "Hey, Sting's promo wasn't very good." <laughs> Those weren't these exact words, but we'll get to that. Nikita Koloff versus Gladiator Number One. Gladiator Number One ran wild at the bell. Nikita put a stop to that, and he won with a sickle. Ronnie Garvin came out for a promo. Still had not put his name on the title belt, by the way, which should have been a sign to everyone. Why bother? Yeah. So he's here actually to plug more than anything else, the uh, autograph signing in Atlanta. Atlanta is, I consider, I consider it my hometown. I can't wait to meet the people there. I want everyone a chance to see me and see this belt and touch this belt. I want to, I want to meet people. I want to sign autographs. I want to give people a chance to, chance to touch the belt. It will be a great pleasure to be there. So be there. He says, I'll be there at 630. It's a pleasure to be there. So be there. He also mentioned flares in a panic. Takes a lot of money to style and profile, he says. His income has dropped dramatically. That's right. He's no longer the champion. I won't change anything, however. I only want this title because I worked my whole life for it. And he says, not a chance. I'm losing the title. Mm. Kendall Wyndham versus Thunderfoot number two. The other gladiator, not the Thunderfoot. That was just Thunderfoot number two. Was it? Yeah, because, they called, because we laughed and they called him foot number two. <laughs> That's right. So, like, the first thing they did is they went and bonked in the corner, and the Thunderfoot number two goes down, and Kendall makes a cover, and the ref says, no, I won't count, he's in the ropes. At which point, foot number two lifts his leg and puts it on the ropes. <laughs> Oops. What was even worse about it is, the ref stops counting after Kendall whacks him out of the corner, and so Kendall picks him up and whips him in as a drop kick, and I'm like, well, something went wrong, here's the real finish. No. No. This fucking dude, this foot, kicked out, and then got the heat. Foot number two got some offense. He was clearly the better worker, by the way. But Kendall won with a bulldog. Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin versus Curtis Thompson and Tony Suber. Here we are again, second week in a row. Michael Hayes is out there in electric blue tights and no underwear. I can see too much of little Michael. The free bird's bird is too free. It's very uncomfortable. They did some stuff. Garvin pinned Super with a brain buster. And they cut a promo about how they're all so excited for Star K. They're so excited for Thanksgiving. Sting's so excited he can't remember what he's supposed to say, Jimmy says. <laughs> <laughs> so he talks about how excited he is, and he says, Michael's going to tell you everything while I kiss my wife. And he kisses Precious. Just the best gimmick ever. And Michael takes his cuts a promo, and he's awesome. Says, uh, Tully and Arn think they're tough because they hang out in a gang. Well, we've been hanging out with gangs on Bad Street, beating all their asses. We're not afraid of you or your gang. And we promised victory at Starcade, and that was that. Dick Murdoch versus Bob Cook. All right, this is Bob Cook, fella. So Dick Murdoch was Buddy Wayne. Bob Cook was Brian Alvarez. I've seen this happen a million times. So, first off, the first great part is this jobber does an arm drag and then stands up and puts up his dukes. <laughs> Because they're in a fight. Yeah. This ain't some performance. They're fighting. So, Cook starts to make this comeback, and Dick Murdoch takes a bump for Bob Cook. I believe he's actually the first guy who actually took a bump for the jobbers comeback on this whole show. Might have been. He takes a bump, he goes down. And he lays there. And he waits for Bob Cook. <laughs> and Bob Cook is standing there. And Murdoch is still down. He's holding his mouth. He's waiting for Bob Cook to come over and get on him. Bob Cook just stands there. I can't tell you how many times I did this when I first started working with Buddy Wayne. He'd give me the office. He'd tell me to hit him or whatever. One, two, whatever. He goes down. I didn't know what the fuck to do. He didn't tell me to do anything. So I just stood there. Announcers are all over this Bob Cook. You gotta get on the guy. Standing there like a bump on a log. That's why he's probably never won a match in his life. So Murdoch gets to his feet. They lock up. And he says, hit me again. Bob Cook hits him again. Murdoch goes down a second time. And he sits there. And Bob Cook just fucking stands there. Murdoch is giving him the fucking office building. Not just the office. 
This fucking guy's just standing there. And so finally, Dick grabs him, throws his ass outside, throws him into the podium, and breaks into a thousand pieces, get a chair, hits him in the head with it. A light chair shot, but still, he whacks the guy in the head with the chair right in front of the referee. Somehow, this is not a disqualification. The ref's like, hey, can you not do that anymore? And then he gives him a brain buster and pins him. What can you do? He tried his best to give Bob Cook something. <laughs> I also like Bob Cook going with the low-cut singlet to make sure his man boobs got maximum exposure. Dude. That was all worth it. Everything, really, in my life was worth it to get to this point. This Dick Murdoch promo. Where to begin? <laughs> well, where to begin is, I don't know for sure, but I think something must have happened, and Murdoch must have lost a tooth. Well, when it when it began, Murdoch was showing off. I don't know if he lost t- uh, teeth or if he removed his fake teeth, but he is showing off a huge gap in his teeth. I presume that he was in a match, and he got his teeth knocked out. And so, since they were going to do TV, that's why he had this jobber punch him a few times. And he was holding his mouth the whole time. Because mm-hmm. then he comes out here and he shows he's missing teeth, mm-hmm. but then he has to be a tough guy and he says... That boy never touched me. Had it under control the whole time. Yeah, but you can see he's missing teeth. Several of them. I'm pretty sure that's what happened. That would make sense. Yeah. So he starts talking about real men in pro wrestling, men who don't need earrings or face paint. He says, why do you announcers only talk about the people you like? Why don't you talk about the people with credibility, the real men in the sport like Ric Flair and Hiro Matsuda? Mm -hmm. He's hoping and praying that Lex Luger will lose a Starcade. He's about to say why when Tony pulls back the mic and says, why? And Dick looks at him and says, because I want to be the one to retire Dusty Rhodes. And he starts talking about how he's going to retire Dusty. He's going to retire Nikita Koloff. He's going to retire that nothing happened in Mellon Farmer from the University of Oklahoma, Steve Williams. And then someone he tried to do something nice for, someone he got into the business, someone who tried to be just another clown, Barry Windham. Harry Windham. He says it repeatedly. It By the funnier. way, what we got to mention is, as he's ranting and raving, and he is raving, okay? We are not doing justice to the raving oh, that is I'm being done I'm not even trying. Here. He is raving to such an extent that he is foaming at the mouth. Yeah. There's foam and slobber drooling out of his mouth as he is cutting this promo about this nothing happened in Mellon Farmer, Dr. Death Steve Williams, and this Barry Windham. He says, listen, I'd do anything for money, but there are a few things I would do for the thrill of doing it. I'd beat up anybody from Oklahoma, and I'd beat up anybody who I did something good for, and they fucked it up, like Barry Windham. And my ex-partner, who took some communist, and at this point... Dick Murdoch lost his mind. He may have been possessed by demons. He pops up. He began speaking in tongues. He was not speaking. He was channeling. (laughs) There there was something from the other side was coming through this man, using him as his vehicle. He's ranting. He's screaming. He's raving. He's spitting. He's frothing at the mouth. He talks about doing his duty for the Marine Corps. He is furious that he made someone famous. And that person deserted him and took on a communist as a partner while he had done his patriotic duty in the Marine Corps, keeping this country safe. Yes. He points to the front row. God, I wish I'd let the communists take it over, he says, pointing at these idiot fans. This is the best promo of all in all of 1988. Maybe the best promo in the all of 1980s. It was out of this world spectacular. Listen. Stick Murdoch. Unsavory character in real life. No angel. He was no angel. But you know what? We're covering professional wrestling here. We're covering his job as a performer. Now, I will preface this by saying, Chris Benoit is never going in the Hall of Awesome. Do you hear me? Mm -hmm. But Dick Murdoch is. Dick Murdoch is the next inductee into the Hall of Awesome. That's right. Because God damn is this man awesome. As we said when it was first started, there's only one criteria criteria to be in the Hall of Awesome, and that is, are you awesome? Dick Murdoch was awesome. Dick Murdoch was awesome. Dick Murdoch was an awesome worker. Dick Murdoch, Dick Murdoch, we've said this before, when Dick Murdoch was a babyface, 
you wanted to go have a barbecue at his house. Mm-hmm. I fucking hate football. If Dick Murdoch says, we're going to be watching the Super Bowl and I'm going to be barbecuing, you want to come over? I'd fucking be there in a heartbeat. But when he was a heel, he was the most dastardly, unlikable, disgusting human being. He could do everything. And he could work. This man's in the Hall of Awesome. There you go. The new breed had to follow that. These two total nerds. They came off so much like two guys playing pro wrestler. You know, I had a... Well, they were. I had my own spectacular failure of a pro wrestling career. But when I explain this to people, their first question every single time, what's your gimmick? And at the time, my viewpoint was, I don't really have one. I just want to get in there and wrestle. Well, someone should have told that to the new breed because they were all gimmick. They were from the future. So they put on shiny silver tops with zippers, random zippers everywhere have cut their hair all wacky, and they tried to live up to their gimmick. So I cut this promo, and it sucks. And it sucks and sucks and sucks. But then, they begin to make fun of the sheep herders. Sean Royal did the greatest sheep herders impersonation of all time. Yeah. It was astonishing. And it was also great. Yeah. So by making fun of the sheep herders, all they did was point out how great the sheep herders were. And how much they suck. And how much the new breed sucks. And they buried the horseman. They buried the horseman, they buried the Midnight Express, and that's that. Neither of these will end well. <laughs> no. <laughs> and the main event, technically not the Sheep Herders. Eric Long and Gary Phelps versus the team of Luke Williams and Johnny Ace. What in the fuck? You take one half of the Sheep Herders and one half of the Dynamic Dudes, you get the Dude Herders. Dude. The Dude Herders? I just made that up. Luke Williams was- I prefer the Dynamic Sheep. <laughs> I do too, come to think of it So Luke Williams was where, well aware of how bad Johnny Ace sucked This match went 30 seconds And they won with the double gut buster He still sucked going 30 seconds It was amazing And then he cut the most horrific I swear to God Has there ever been a worse promo? <laughs> we buried the new breed But I mean, they were laughing So Butch is the one who always does all the talking Luke's job is to grunt and roar Just go, hey cousin But Butch isn't there so Luke has to do the talking this week. It's not very good, but it's not, like, horrible. It was all right. He talks about Butch accepting a Sportsman of the Year award, which is why he's not there, when Johnny Ace has to interrupt. Which is hilarious, by the way. It is. And Johnny says, listen, I was born in America, but now that I've been around the world, I realize that the men and women of... And he thinks, and he thinks... And he looks around, and he looks at the flag that he's carrying, and he says, New Zealand are superior athletes. And then the show ended. That's how they went out. This promo was so bad. They ended with this. Yeah. Dude. Well, at least we got a new entry into the Hall of Awesome. We did. And a well-deserved one. Dick Murdoch. Mm-hmm. All right, everybody. And there will be gorilla shit all over the army. <laughs> it's not a requirement. You can play the window, uh, video in one window and bring a Scrabble over the top of it. You could. You still get the audio. You could. All right, let's talk about NWA here. There's a lot to get into. There's a lot of very bad stuff on the show. Just over a week before Starcade 87. It, it's the go-home show to the go-home show for Starcade. I feel the, like, and part of it is because we, we, we miss shows here and there with pay-per-views and whatnot, but I feel like we've been in the build of Starcade for about three years now. Well, you got to remember there wasn't one show a month back then. This is That's like, also true. This is their WrestleMania. We're already doing a WrestleMania build on Raw. Yeah. That show's in for three months now. But at least, I don't think, I'm assuming on Raw they have not announced the entire Mania card. Hell no. Okay. The Starcade card has been out there for weeks. Well, so We'll get to the Starcade there's, card. There's nothing new to do. They just have guys kill time. I should mention, by the way, let's just get it out of the way first. This is the biggest collection of bullshit, fucked up, idiot jobbers we've ever had on this show. Am I wrong? There were two or three times where I, w- I-, I was certain I knew who the worst wrestler of all time of the week wrong. was. And it turned out there was a three-way tie. Oh, dude, there's like a seven-way tie. <laughs> there's so many terrible jobbers on this show. It was show. astounding. I'm assuming most of these men have wrestled again. Wrong! The guy that I thought was the worst jobber on the show does a shit ton of work for Crockett. Huh. I don't know if he just had a bad day. I was going to finish my sentence. I assume many of them could not physically wrestle anymore no, or walk. They just kept going. Well, we'll get to it. Here we go. Right off the bat, 
This show opens with clips of Kendall Wyndham wrestling with Larry Zabisco. And in hindsight, I don't know why. Because Kendall never appeared in this show. Larry did, but he only ever mentioned the other Wyndham. The other Windham. So the video is... Apparently, WWE Network found a copy of the show at a garage sale and bought a copy of a copy of a copy of a VHS tape. There's like scroll bars going down horizontally the whole time. And they wrestle a bit. What do they used to call that? Tracking. Tracking. Yeah. The tracking was off. <laughs> the tracking was very bad on this. We are dating ourselves. But, uh... It's our job. We're, we're reviewing a show from 1987, for fuck's sake. Kendall Wyndham's tracking was also off. He missed a dive and appeared to go throat first into the top rope. And they cut there, and they went to the announcers, and this segment was never spoken of again. No. Hey, by the way, any uh, Super Bowl commentary? Holy shit, what a game. Really? Jesus Christ. <laughs> that was amazing. You didn't mention that right at the start of the show, if it was that amazing? You didn't ask. We're doing a wrestling show. Come on, it's the Super Bowl. We talk about this every year. I have two jobs. I don't do both at the same time. Unluckily for you, I didn't watch it this year. Okay. Otherwise, I would have given my... Your review? Yeah. Okay. Like I did that one year that I watched it. All right. So how was it? It was awesome. Well, can you give us some details so... for the zero of us that didn't watch it? Well, I assume anyone who cared watched it. Well, you know, I was going to come to the Brian and Vinny show for football scores. I was at the gym, and you know, so you don't care. There were people there, so some people did skip the Super Bowl. Oh, and I know, but maybe they want to know. But now if you that, skip like, the Super Bowl, if you skip the Super Bowl, I don't see why you care about my opinion on this show. I'll tell you if why. You want my opinion? Go I'll to footballoutsiders dot com. I'll tell you why. Audible's the line published later tonight. I'll tell you why. Because maybe you don't care about football, mm -hmm. but the next day when you go to work. Everyone's going to talk about football, and so ah. you want to pretend like you know what you're talking about. I see. That's what your job is. There's actually some, there's some, uh, some Thank value to you. that. So, what happened? Well, you had the, what, what usually happens in Patriots games, Super Bowls at least. Deflated they, balls? No. Mm -hmm. uh, they fall behind, they rally and take the lead, but then this time they still lost. Oh, man. Which is amazing. <laughs> the, the, the underdogs... The uh, the backup team, the backup quarterback, backup left tackle. Uh, they were missing a running back. They were out there starting kicker. They were out a linebacker. They still won, and uh, it was it, it was a tremendous game. Probably well, definitely the best game of the year. Obviously, uh, Nick Foles exceeded everyone's expectations. He's still under contract for next year. We'll see if he's going to be a backup again, or I think I'm sure somebody's going. to Well, I shouldn't say I'm sure. Somebody's going to try to trade for him. We'll see what happens. We don't know if Carson Wentz is going to be ready for the year or not. Anyway, but um, if I was a Lions fan and I, I watched my new head coach and his defense, which has been overrated by most people all year long, and they just made uh, Philadelphia's backup quarterback the Super Bowl MVP, I'd be pretty worried. That's bad news for Detroit. Um, I don't know, man. I don't give in math class. Great game for, for Doug Peterson. Great game for... Uh, uh, Nick Foles has said every, really everyone in Philadelphia. Alshon Jeffrey had some amazing catches in the first half. Um, just a just a, a hell of a football game. Man, when are the Seahawks going back to the Super Bowl? Is there any hope? There's hope. Is there Tony, any Tony's real shaking hope? his head. I was going right. to say Tony's disagreeing with you here. There's hope. As like, an expert, don't give me this. Is there hope? I want to know are they going next year? Unlikely. Well, it's unlikely for everyone. If you if your option is Team A or the field, you're better off always taking the field. Well, I know, but usually, like every year, you go. In fact, the one year you go, the, Se the Seahawks are actually the favorites for next year. You yeah. said that when the Super Bowl was over. Sure. They're not the favorites for next year. No, they're not. Okay. That's what I'm asking. Okay. All right. But anything can happen. Anything can happen. Are you excited to be covering the XFL in a couple of years, starting right now? We'll see how it goes. Mm. If, uh, I can't I'm, wait I'm, for I'm this. <laughs> all I rem honestly, all I remember about it is the, the first game they did was a disaster. It was hideously dull. And the, the game that they did that went long... And, uh, like, Saturday Night Live got bumped and basically got NBC pissed at them and was kind of the, the beginning of the end, which I think was in week two. People don't remember this. That was actually a really good football game. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Hmm. The LA Extreme and somebody, but it was fun. It's been 17 years. Well, so we're talking about wrestling now. Yeah, Ron Simmons. Yeah, speaking of football, Ron Simmons Exactly. Is here. Yeah. Look at my tie-in. Like, excellent segue. Thank you. So this is a different Ron Simmons than we've seen before. He's angrier. He says, talked about how what's going to go down at Starcade is worse than a major war in the projects. A couple brothers there who've forgotten what it's like to grow up have to fight your brother for a pair of jeans because you're the one who wants to wear them. They've forgotten what it's like to ask your mama what's for dinner, and she says nothing because the stamps didn't come. He's upset at the jive tones. The jive tones. 
He's going to teach him a lesson at Stargate. They didn't even mention who the Jive Tones were. We'd never heard of him before? They, he just said the Jive Tones are going to find out who's the toughest. I guess they assumed every fan watching TBS... That's impossible. In 87 was I also... Think, I think we were supposed to learn who they were. Well, there was no Google. And boy... Everyone run down to the market and buy PWI? Did we ever find learn out what the who Jive Tones the did four Jive months prior? Jive Tones were at the end of this show. That's true. Steve Williams versus Rex King. Okay. Not everything on the show is terrible. Steve Williams, in a completely terrifying manner, destroyed this man. It was like a shoot. Yes. There was a legit shoot pro wrestling arm drag in this match. Yes. First, he did his power slam like a minute in. That was his finish. But it was only a minute in. So pick the guy up. He goes for a press slam. Now, those little inside baseball here, for those of you who don't know about how wrestling works, when you press slam a guy, the guy being press slammed posts up with his hands on your shoulders to make it easier to lift him over your head. Uh, Rex King, it was Steve Williams versus Rex King. Did I mention that? Rex King did not have his hands on Dr. Death's shoulders or his head. They were out to his sides waving in the air. As Dr. He Death, didn't need to. He could have done reps. He could have held him up there for days. I like when Dr. Death did his power slam early and Rex King was going to do a leapfrog and Dr. Death would catch him. And I guess Rex King wasn't sure if Dr. Death could catch him because he jumped really fucking high. Mm. And Dr. Death was underneath him for like a full second before the guy finally came down and he caught him. Yeah. So he power slams this guy, and then he pulls him up at two. But then he arm drags him and doesn't pull him up. No. And Rex King kicks out of an arm drag. Yes. Okay, this was not the best match technically, no. but it was fun. It was a great spectacle. Yes. So he runs wild. He does his spear, which again is more like a running backdrop. I've never seen anyone do this move like this. And eventually he hit, a, he hit his power slam and won. All I could think of was this was done is I want a time machine so I can go back to the early 1980s and make mixed martial arts a viable career and get Steve Williams in the octagon. I'll have more to say on this later. It's called Brawl for All, baby. Uh, Didn't turn out well for Not him. the same. Plus, it was not the same Steve Williams. No, it was the same guy. It was 10 years later. That's true. Yeah. So, so then he cuts his... I got to talk about this promo very quickly. Right. So he's having a babyface match against Barry Windham at Starcade. Now, they can't call it a babyface match. So he's explaining, I'm a competitor. I like you. I respect you, Barry Windham. You're a competitor. We're going to be competing here at this Starcade show. He says, and I quote, It's like a football game or a wrestling match. This wrestling match, Vinny, yeah. is going to be like a wrestling match. He did say that. That's what he said. He also said, this isn't going to be a fight. It's going to be a wrestling match. It'll be about technique. Yes. And he began to list off all the moves he had just performed. The go-behinds, the arm drags, the single legs. Somebody's got to be turning. I don't remember. We'll find out. Yeah. This was neither a great promo nor a great match this week, but it was it was exciting. It, it, the promo actually was much like the match. It was sloppy, but a spectacle. He, yes. He's shouting about how he's been defending the UWF belt all over the world. It took him a long time to get it, with lots of people trying to stab him in the back. Which, what does that even mean if this is a real sport? I enjoy this. Well, it's not, because <laughs> this match is going to be like a wrestling match. That's true. Starcade Control Center. All right, here's the card. I wrote it down for you. We got Eddie Gilbert, Larry Zbysko, and Rick Steiner versus Jimmy Garvin, Michael Hayes, and Sting. We've got Dr. Death versus Barry Windham for the UWF heavyweight title. Mm -hmm. Rock and Roll Express versus the Midnight Express in a scaffold match. Yes. Nikita Koloff versus Terry Taylor for the NWA and UWF World TV titles. Unification, Unification match, match, yes. Arn and Tully versus the Road Warriors. The home team, as Tony called them. For the NWA World Tag Team titles. Dusty Rhodes versus Lex Luger in a cage match for the U.S. title. And Ric Flair versus Ron Garvin in a cage match for the NWA World Heavyweight title. Tony says, Jim says, we have one stipulation left to add. Johnny Weaver will hold the key the to the cage The keeper of the match. key. Like a Tolkien character. Johnny Weaver is so happy to be a part of Starcade. <laughs> You're holding a fucking key. Yeah. Then we get this rematch or this recap of an angle with Paul Jones and the Mighty Wilbur. 
Wilbur turns on Paul Jones, gives him an elbow and a big splash, crushing his ribs, leaves smiling. He leaves smiling and shaking hands with fans. Yes. Because he's Mighty Wilbur. I'll let you talk about Mighty Wilbur, but they announce... Did you hear the card I just read? Yeah. That's the final card. Yeah. They announced, however, Mighty Wilbur versus Ivan Koloff. Mm-hmm. Mighty Wilbur is in the control center to promote this match here. Mm-hmm. It wasn't on the show. I don't know what happened. I'll tell you what happened. Okay. They wasted all that time on this, and they ended up, they were like, think about how many closed circuit locations there were across the country. Okay. In one of them, they aired that match. Why? I don't know. What a waste of my You're life. Asking the wrong person. I'd have been very angry if I watched this and I didn't get my Mighty Wilbur versus Ivan Koloff match. Now, Mighty tries to cut a promo to hype this match. He is clearly reading several feet above and to the side of the camera, reading directly off a cue card. And as he's reading his lines, he guesses something about how I'm going to take you out of Starcade. And he stops. And he waits for the card to turn, and eventually they convince him there's no more cards, and he says, and that's it! (laughs) (laughs) It was a wonderfully bad promo. But it's Mighty Wilbur. It was like, it was perfect for Mighty Wilbur. It's part of his gimmick. Yes, this was great. He's not a honed performer. No. He's a fruit picker. He is a... As we'll get to later. He is a great picker from California, and he's just here doing his best. He's just nervous. All right, here is the parade, the beginning of the parade of terrible, terrible wrestlers. Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin versus Eric Long and Gary Phelps. Now, we determined... Oh, I determined. Eric Long was the... the... Eric Long. So the fans are chanting that the jobbers are pieces of crap. Okay, (laughs) Mean people. Yeah, and and I would not call them pieces of crap, but I would say that Eric Long was a sack of shit. And how is that different? He would not go up for anything. That's actually true. He was like a dead body. They're they're desperately struggling to work with this guy. So, let me, yeah. Jimmy goes for a body slam, and as you noted, Eric Long completely deadweights him. Yeah. So Jimmy says, fuck this, and just drops the guy. Like, in fact, a sack of shit. Now, Michael, Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin, they're not Rick Rude or the Barbarian, or Mang, or, you know, terribly dangerous men in the world of pro wrestling. Not, not Dr. Death, for God's sake. But they started beating the shit out of this guy. Because <laughs> he sucked. And he made him look bad. You they, know, here's a, here's, a, here's a bad analogy, but... Uh, that's the first. When my, when my baby was first born, and she was like eight pounds... You Where are you going this? with this? I'll tell you. She was like eight, eight pounds, nine pounds, ten pounds, okay? When they're that oh, little, okay. they haven't learned to hold on to you yet. So basically, you're carrying dead weight. By the time they're 15, 16 pounds, now they kind of hold on to you a little bit. Right? Sure. Okay, so they, they don't feel as heavy. Because they're helping a little. So when you lift a fucking guy up for a side suplex, okay? You grab him around the waist. You go to lift the guy up. He holds on to your waist. He can hold on to your arm or whatever. Sure. He's helping you a little bit. Yeah. This fucking Gary Phelps, they go for a side suplex, and he's like, he's stiff as a board. Do you know how hard it is to lift a guy who's stiff as a board like that? Pretty hard. Fucking just dropped him. Yeah. As they should have. They threw him outside. They chopped him so he had to bump on the cement. Michael Hayes, of all people, is throwing these just forearms of death to the guy's back, hitting him as hard as he can. Because he sucks. Because he sucks. Eventually, they threw him to the corner, and Gary Phelps tagged in. Now, Phelps was at least trained. He was less terrible. He was he was competent. Uh, he did have the fashion sense to go with the singlet. And I love there's I've seen this before on these Saturday night shows. I don't know why guys just don't get a shirt or a full covered singlet. This guy gets the singlet where the 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 neck essentially is cut down almost to the navel. So you just have two thin straps running up the chest, which is fine if you have a great body. But if you are Gary Phelps, all it does is lift and separate your man boobs to make them extra jigglier. It's a terrible Or it display. goes around the side so it squishes them together. Yeah, and you get cleavage. That happens yeah. too. Oh, Just, man. <laughs> terrible. Like, like, this is horrid. They went on national TV like this. Sickening. They looked at, looked at the mirror and said, I'm good. So they did some stuff and they pinned him with a bulldog. It's grotesque. 
The sort of Freebirds got a promo after the break. Hyped up Starcade. You know, I got to say, Jimmy Garvin's trying so hard to put over Ronnie. Ronnie was such a failure. Mm-hmm. Like, TV ratings slashed in half. They, like, dropped out of, like, the top five into below the top 15. Just absolutely hideous. And so he's here trying to put over his brother, and it's like a heel move. <laughs> Ronnie's going to win. He's going to beat Ric Flair. It's like nobody wants to see that, dude. But he's trying. So, yeah, they called out uh, the winners of the tag team titles, whoever that would be, although it would probably be the Road Warriors, they were sure to say. And he says at Starcade, people are going to lose titles and money and egos and maybe even careers, but we're not losing anything. Rick Steiner versus Keith Steinborn. Holy shit. They must have been put together just because their names are similar. So I'm pretty sure this was Rick's Saturday night debut. He's out there looking huge and scary. And he does like the exact same match Dr. Death did, where he's doing incredible power moves and then actual legit amateur takedowns. So he picks Keith Steinborn up over his shoulder. And he does the running face first slam in the turnbuckles, which he did his entire career. It was the first time Jimmy Crockett had seen this. And I'm quite certain the happiest moment of Jimmy Crockett's life. He had a moment of ecstasy. It, uh, honestly, if we play that audio, he said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And then he goes, ow! He did howl like a wolf after it was all said and done. I'm not making that up. No. So Rick beat him up for a while. That was the craziest thing I've ever seen David Crockett do. So far, and think about that. He, he has never gone crazy for something like he went crazy for there. The, the greatest moment of, of his life, I'm convinced. So the match went on, and Rick went with a belly-to-belly, and all I could think was when this is done was, I want to pay a lot of money to watch Rick Steiner fight Steve Williams. You know, that funny, sounds awesome. What's funny about this is, is uh, so in 1988, I guess Dusty had this idea of Rick Steiner's going to beat Ric Flair in five minutes at Starcade. This was a goddamn scandal back then. Yeah. Okay? In, like, this is another one of those things in hindsight. If this fucking guy would have beat Ric Flair, I got no problem with that. <laughs> this is not like Tank Abbott winning the world no, title or no. David Arquette or any of Russo's stupid ideas. No. Like, I realized that a year ago I thought, what's so bad about Ron Garvin beating Ric Flair? Okay, clearly I was wrong when it actually happened. And maybe I'd be wrong if Rick Steiner would have beat Ric Flair in five minutes of Starcade, but this fucking guy here looked like a monster. Mm-hmm. He was practically the size of Scott in 1999. He was huge. His shoulders are like out to here. His traps are like in line with the top of his head. He's suplexing this fucker everywhere. He's throwing him around. He just looked like a monster. Pointing and laughing at him. Dude, he looked awesome. <laughs> yeah. It is now time for the Spam Slam of the Week. They left this in. <laughs> I'm so happy they left this in. I am so happy they left this in. So, you know, to this day, I think WWE still does a sponsored move of the week, or it may be the slam of the week for all I know, but the slam of the week was the Garvin... Excuse me, the slam of the week? I'll repeat this for okay. those of you who have not been paying attention. The spam slam of the week. Slam. Slam. Okay. It was the Garvin stomp. That ain't no slam. Which is appropriate, because spam is not technically food. Yeah, you're right. You got me there. So it makes sense. What in the fuck was this? It was the Spam Slam of the Week. Dude. The rule was when the guys got all the tapes to digitize for the WWE Network, they had to deal with commercials. And they were basically told, if a commercial's really funny, you can leave it in if you want. <laughs> That's when we watch those retro Raws every now and then. There's like some preposterous thing that they did that they leave in there. And you're like, why the fuck did they leave it? Because it was funny. Yes. I, think, I presume that's the Spam Slam of the Week. I am totally down with that. I, yeah. I endorse the Spam Slam of the Week. Dusty Rhodes had like eight seconds to cut a promo passionately plugging a tape called The Danger Zone. Yeah. Came out and said, it's the hottest tape out there. You got to get it. And they cut away. And it's weird because like they did that. They cut away. Then they came back and they just started over. Yes. Superpowers are out there. No mention of The Danger Zone or what is actually on this, except it's a tape and Dusty wants us to buy it. Nikita says he can't wait for Starcade and the TV title unification match against Terry Taylor. Dusty lists every single babyface on the roster and says they are responsible for the hottest product on TV. He starts calling out Lex Luger, says, if you want to beat the legend, all you have to do, Haas, is beat the legend. 
Ricky Santana versus Bob Emery. This was fine. It was a minute. Here's all I wrote. Nothing happened. Then Ricky screamed and won with a flying body press. That's what happened. Yeah. But that's an improvement over the usual five minutes of holds that Ricky Santana had been doing over the last couple of weeks. Sure. I got no problem with this. So he cuts a promo. Now, last week, you will recall, he was talking about Starcade, and he mentioned that he thought Ronnie Garvin would beat Ric Flair. Yes. And then Ric Flair was outraged. He came out later in the show. He called Santana a minority and warned him not to talk about Flair anymore. <laughs> that is exactly what happened. Yes. So Santana comes back out this week, and he mentions Ric Flair again. I'm not sure what he said, because he was speaking Spanish at the time. But he talks about Flair, he speaks in Spanish, and he goes on his way, and all I can think is, man, next week's the go-home show for Starcade, and I suspect young Mr. Santana is in for a long, long afternoon. Well, you know, he said that I got my money on, on Dusty, and I got my money on Ronnie. So, I mean, he likely came out even. <laughs> well, there's that. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. So he finishes... <laughs> And Tony's about to wrap it up, and Kevin Sullivan inter- interrupts. I have never in all my years watching wrestling seen a man turning purple and screaming with rage doing predictions for a pay-per-view. So that's what he was doing. This is not a knock. What I'm about to say is not a knock on Kevin Sullivan as a person or as a performer, but I am really, really sick of him coming out here every week with nothing to say. All he does is do predictions. He did. Can we get this guy a program? Oh, it's coming. S- something to talk it, about for it's himself? Coming, it's coming very soon. But it was bizarre. It was bizarre. He's giving his predictions for the top matches at Starcade, and he's screaming at the top of his lungs and in a rage. I don't even know why. He's very angry. There's no way in hell, he says, Ronnie Garvin could ever beat Ric Flair. Well, five weeks ago, he did. So there's at least one way. He says there's no way Luger can beat Dusty Rhodes in a cage. So he's... Seriously doubting the babyface world heavyweight champion. Yeah. But then also seriously doubting the heel U.S. heavyweight champion. Yeah. And then he says there's no way Barry Windham can beat Steve Williams. So he's seriously doubting one of the two babyfaces. I don't know. what. I don't know. He just comes out and rants and raves about nothing, and it never goes anywhere. It will. <laughs> Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson versus B.T. Washington and El Negro. B.T. Washington. Yes. Where'd that guy come from? I did not get his hometown. Hmm. He's out there with the he's wrestling in bare feet, the uh, Hawaiian print trunks over his black tights, like every 1980s Polynesian wrestler. The match was short. The horseman... He was Polynesian? That's how he was dressed. I see. That's what I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so the horseman pinned El Negro, who was just a masked black guy, Pinned him very quickly with the uh, double gourd buster. But there was a point to all of this. There was a point to all this. Yes. The announcer said it, but then the horseman made it clear after the break when they were cutting their promo. Tully says, J.J. Dillon, how much does animal weigh? J.J. says, I believe Road Warrior animal weighs about 280 pounds. Tully says, J.J., how much does hawk weigh? J.J. says, I believe Road Warrior hawk weighs about 272 pounds. And Tully says, well... That man we just hit with a double gore buster goes at least 350. So this proves we can hit either Road Warrior with a double gore buster. Don't doubt what we're capable of. Said so the Road Warriors being nervous and throwing up at Starcade, whereas themselves were calm and in control. They arm went on a long rant and really didn't say much. They learned from everyone and they're going to be champions. At he said there would be balls broken at Starcade. He said bones. No, come on. All I know is that Tully is a great promo, and Arn talked circles around this guy tonight. Arn was on fire. It was great. Ivan Koloff and Warlord versus Curtis Thompson and Max MacGyver. So I'm not sure who was in there with Warlord. Curtis Thompson was beaten. Okay. Warlord, what he did, the result was he did a press slam and then dropped him across his knee into a backbreaker. That was the result. I honestly don't think that's what he was going for. I think he was press slamming him. I don't know what he was going for, but he pulled that off. The, the result looked fine. Yeah. It looked like he was press slamming him, legitimately dropped him, and stuck his knee out trying to break his fall. Well. Like he's trying to save his life. Great. I guess. That'd be a good move to start doing now. Sure. And so, then Tony Schiavone said, and I quote, that Curtis Thompson was beaten to death here. <laughs> Those were his exact words. They won quickly with the backbreaker elbow combo, and then it was time for the best thing on the show. 
This was the best thing on the show by miles. By miles. On a show with a Ric Flair promo. A good Ric Flair promo. That Rick Steiner match. Yeah. The Dr. Death match. So you've got Paul Jones, who's incredibly wacky. Ivan Koloff, who is not terribly wacky by 1980s pro wrestling standards. And the warlord, who is just standing in the background like Braun Strowman's dad. He is just a big guy looking at the camera, saying and doing nothing. So Jones starts on his rant. He apologizes. Paul Jones, number one Paul Jones, apologizes to the people for bringing in the mighty Wilbur. This goddamn fruit picker from California. Gutless monster, he says. Gutless monster. He can't deny he's a monster. He's huge, but he's gutless. And he's ranting about how terrible he is there. Ivan tries to calm him down. He promises Paul Jones, don't you worry. I will have this great picker back in California with his fruit. I guarantee Mm -hmm. I will send this fruit picker back to California. He says, I saw the way he treated you, Paul Jones. Mighty Wilbur. (laughs) Let's recreate this. Okay. I'll be Paul. (laughs) Okay. Okay. He says, Ivan says, Wilbur, you will not pat me on the head and call me Puddin Head. Ah! I believe he actually maybe even said Puddin Head Jones. But either way. He said, he just howled. (laughs) As they were doing this, left to right, you've got Ivan, Paul, and Warlord. And as Ivan is talking, the camera goes to a shot of all three. It goes to a tight zoom in on the Warlord. It's, it's a slow, tight zoom in, but it's, it, it's zooming in on him, so you barely see Ivan and Paul in the frame. But then again, when Ivan mentions the word Puddin' Head, ah! and the warlord, looking right into the camera, just smiles. He's he, try, he, he is trying to be big and mean. He tries so hard. And just goes... <laughs> and you notice, after that, they cut away from him <laughs> and show him the anymore. rest of the deal. <laughs> oh, this is awesome. Oh, there's more. I forgot. Hang on. Ivan now turns about how this whole thing with Mighty Wilbur being here in the first place, it's all Red Bastine's fault. He's going to take personal pleasure in embarrassing Wilbur. I'm going to revenge Paul Jones. I'm going to take it out of your big, ugly body. And they leave. This was awesome. <laughs> Must see stuff. Everyone go watch this right now. J.J. Dillon and Alex Luger cut a promo. I will be honest, I was still recovering from and recapping the Paul Jones segment, so I missed a lot of this. Uh, what I got out of it is that at one point, Lex used the word stupid stars. All you need to know is he said that as good as Dusty's been all these years, a better athlete always comes along, and Dusty needs to remember that. Okay. It was fine. And the fans were trying st- very hard. And the fans were chaining steroids at him. We had Lex Luger versus Tony Suber. This fucking guy. <gasps> no amount of steroids. Was helping Lex Luger in this match. This fucking Tony Suber is the guy. This guy did a shit ton of matches for Crockett. He's the worst fucking jobber I've ever seen in my life. He couldn't go up for the rack. Lex Luger's torture rack. I have seen Lex Luger rank, rack uh, Rick Fuller. I've seen him rack Kevin Nash. I've seen him rack Scott Hall. I've seen him rack the giant. Tony Suber couldn't get up for this. Fuck. And now, first off, before that. Yes. All Luger tries to do is whip the guy into the corner. Mm-hmm. Suber fucks up a Irish whip into the corner, and all you hear is David Crockett, who like 90% of the time you think that he thinks it's real. This fucking jobber fucks up and he just goes, oh. That happened. He actually fucked up Irish whips more than once. He would get whipped in the ropes of turnbuckles and then just stop running. So Lex has finally had enough. He signals for the torture rack. He goes to lift up Tony Suber. Suber gets maybe halfway up his back. And for like three or four seconds, he's just like hanging upside down on Lex's one shoulder. And Lex says, fuck this. And he just lets go. Gravity wins. And Tony Suber ends up on the back of his neck on the mat. Just dropped him right on his fucking head. He folded over upside down, Mm -hmm. knees, knees touching the mat. So he lays there. Tony wonders if this man has just broken his neck. Lex makes sure he's alive, and then just does an elbow smash and pins him. He's done with this guy. This was appalling. Ric Flair got a promo. Basically, well... Okay, here's the deal. It's largely every Ric Flair promo ever. He's trying to cut the ultimate heel promo. I'm better than everybody. I was born with a golden spoon in my mouth. I dress in the most expensive clothes. I drive the biggest car to the biggest house. 
on the biggest hill in town. Everybody cheers. <laughs> He's trying so hard to get booed. Finally, he just says, these idiots over here. And they go, boo! And he goes, aha! <laughs> he was so happy. <laughs> that pretty much happened. He had to finally resort to bullshit cheap heat, but he got him to But boo. it worked. It did. So, yes, he explained that because of the, he was born with a golden spoon in his mouth, that's why he was successful now, which is actually just a great line because it implies if you are not born rich, you will always be a loser. And he says uh, Ronnie Garvin has to wrestle the man with the golden spoon and soon he'll be a five-time champion. It was so bizarre hearing Ric Flair going on and on about how he was a four-time champion. I know. <laughs> four times? Does he mean 14? He meant four. The other funny part of this was the way it was shot is... Uh, uh, David Crockett was in the background just, just smiling the whole time. Not, not, I don't think he knew he was on camera, but he was just reacting to Ric Flair's promo. <laughs> we had something amazing here. I forgot about this until right now. I believe this was right when Tony showed up. <laughs> what a thing to walk into. Yes, Tony, Tony, Admin Nails walked into the room trying to make sense of this. There's a shot of a campfire. We are out on the range. It's, it's nighttime. We are literally... At the home on the range. Yeah, yeah. Now, it's nighttime, but Johnny Johnny Weaver's sitting around the campfire. He offers us a cup of coffee. I should get my guitar right now. There was, in fact, a lone guitar playing a sad song throughout this entire promo as Johnny Weaver spoke, and later we saw clips of men doing battle. So, Johnny says, it's been a long time, but I was in the first one. Suffered a broken arm fighting 20 or 30 cowboys in the very first... Bunkhouse stampede. Oh. What it would be is everyone, everyone on the ranch would go in for their fight, and they'd be in their shirts and their jeans and their boots and their spurs. And the winner was the last one left standing. Stand in, I should add, not standing. Stand in. Says Dory Funk Jr. did the first one in Texas, and at this point they cut to clips of just the most horrible battle royal. It's just a bunch of guys in jeans and t-shirts laying on each other. Some of them randomly bleeding. He says, you can bring any weapon. A cowbell or a good branding iron. Yeah, any weapon. <laughs> a cowbell or a good branding iron. I would have said a knife or How a gun. How about a gun? He did mention there aren't many rules. Aha! But he didn't mention what they were. I presume like firearms and sharp objects. If you can't carry it on a plane, although a branding iron. Hmm. Dude, 87, I'm sure you could carry a gun on a plane. <laughs> That's actually a good point. So, says there's going to be no friends when there's money involved, but the winner can call himself the Bull of the Woods. He tried so hard. <laughs> this was preposterous. So hokey. Speaking of. Oh my God, Ron fucking Garvin. You know, we've been watching the Retro Raws, talking about how horrible Mick Foley as world champion looks every week. On his worst day. He didn't look as bad as Ronnie Garvin did here. I, I wouldn't go that far. I don't know, man. Sweatpants in a in a button up shirt that's torn. At least this he, guy at least had a jean jacket and jeans. Ronnie Garvin looked like a guy. Mankind was at least a guy in a leather mask. There's something spooky and weird about that. He was a homeless guy in a mask. That made him scary. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Ronnie's out here in a brand new trucker cap. There's a thick denim jacket. Probably, here, here's the thing. Mankind at least looks like looks like a character on a show. Ronnie Garvin, who was supposed to be the common man, looked way too common. He over That's his gimmick, he, geek! He overshot his target. He says, listen, there's 180 million people wearing jean jackets Stop in this right country. There. Where did he get denim statistics? 180 million people, he says, wear denim. It's, he's probably right. He says, "I listen, last time I checked, I'm the champion. That means I'm the best. And that means I can wear whatever I want. So if I want to wear a jean jacket and drive a goddamn pickup truck, I can do that. Hey. I was fine with it. I mean, it sucked, but <laughs> it was in his character. I suppose that's true. Larry Zabisco versus... He says, oh. everything Ric Flair owns will be repossessed because I will retain the title and Flair will not be able to pay for his lifestyle. Because he lives on credit. <laughs> Well, he's not wrong about that part. I mean, it wasn't a terrible promo, but this guy's the world champion. That was the problem. That's the problem. Larry Zabisco versus Ricky Nelson. Baby Doll also returning to the territory to be in Larry's corner. I was hoping a luchador would be on commentary talking about how Larry was too slow, but it didn't happen. 
It's a boring fucking match. Mary beat him up for a while. He won with a neck breaker. Had yeah. a goddamn terrible promo, gasping for air. His match went. It was a Larry Zabisco match. Yeah. Nothing happened. They went two minutes. It was over in two minutes. Yeah. He, he exerted no energy. Then he nearly died. It was, talking. It was astonishing. I'm not sure what happened. It's not like he was new. He'd been wrestling for like 15 years at this point. Claimed 13 glorious years. There you go. So he said he came to the top territory between the top belts, and that's why he brought Baby Doll with him, because she was familiar with everyone. She had the secret scouting reports and all the big names in the territory. He turned to uh, Barry Windham, or just Barry Windham, and said, Barry, I'm giving you a chance to surrender the Western States heavyweight title to myself or to Baby Doll before you get embarrassed. And he went on to Dusty Rhodes, who, of course, last time we saw Baby Doll, she was in uh, Dusty's corner. He says, Baby Doll knows more about you than your own mother does, and now I do, too. Then he says, we're going right to the top! And that was it. Horrible. Speaking of, Eddie Gilbert, Terry Taylor, two geeks. Horrible. Fucked up slingshot. That was it. George Fox was horrendous. They pinned him with a move looking something like a 3D. And then went to get a promo. I believe we've asked this question before. Why was Eddie Gilbert uh, portrayed as the lesser star of these two? I, I don't know. He was... A better wrestler. He was a much better talker. He had way more star power. The only thing I can figure is that Terry Taylor was, and this is true, taller. He was taller. That's all I got. And I got to say that of all of the promos that Terry has done to date, this he did show more personality in this one than any of them. But the fans in the front row still chanted geek at him. This guy in, in 12 days is about to face the Russian nightmare Nikita Koloff. Yeah. And I know they're pushing it. They're not pushing it as the epic matchup. They're pushing it as watch this guy get the beating he deserves. But still, yeah. he's facing the Russian Nightmare Nikita Koloff, and the fans are just chanting geek at him. He cuts a promo. It's not... It was fine. It was okay. But then A.D. Gilbert goes and just blows him out of the water. Yep. <laughs> I don't know. Jim Cornette came out for a promo. He says, the Midnight Express is not here today. They're doing charity work. Yes. You see, sweet Stan Lane heard there was a home for unwed mothers that was close to going out of business. So to give them more business, he was out there producing more unwed mothers. Genius. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> Unmatched genius. He plugged the War Games match for a while, and he plugged the Scaffold match for a while, and that was that. <clears throat> Barry Windham versus Cougar J. This was like the only decent squash match on the show. Barry was good. Cougar J everything was, else was fine. Everything else was great or horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Or just very, very short. Uh, Barry won with a superplex. No, this was like a competent jobber. And Cougar J sucks. So, I mean, that tells you about every other jobber on this show. Yeah. So Barry cuts a promo saying Dr. Death was underestimating him. After the match, they would walk away friends and competitors. Someone's got to be turning. <laughs> he added... I don't trust either of these guys. He added that Zabisco had no idea how hard he had worked to get this Western States Heritage Championship. Western States Heritage Title. That's what it's called. Uh. Luke Williams and Johnny Ace versus David Isley and Tommy Angel. I could tell you almost nothing about this match as far as what happened in the ring. All I can tell you is that Butch Miller was on commentary. I'm not certain he inhaled at any point. I believe he spoke, screamed really the entire time, and he was great. So last week he wasn't there, and they said that he was... They had some excuse. Like a, winning a medal from the Prime Minister of something like that, something. yeah. So, so he's back this week, but he's still not wrestling. Yeah. And, I mean, I don't know if he was hurt or what. They had to put Johnny Ace in the ring. He sucks. But we did get Butch on commentary, and he was so... Okay, so, you're right. He didn't take one breath. <laughs> he talked nonstop. It was like a granny segment where it's over and you're exhausted. Mm -hmm. He just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. I don't know what happened in the match. It doesn't matter. But they won. And then, as soon as it's over, Tony has the mic and he's going to interview both men. And Butch grabs the mic out of his hand and says, You've been talking the whole bloody time! And then cut a promo. <laughs> How great is this guy? How did he not win like Best on Promos 1988? I don't know. He's I'm ready, I'm ready to vote for him in 2018. Fuck, he was great. God, the sheep herders were awesome. We, and I, I never realized at the time. So, among his among his statements, how great it was to wave the New Zealand flag. New Zealand, a country where men are men and women are women. The land is filled with song and beauty. Look at this man, Johnny Ace, Tony Schiavone. Look at Johnny Ace. Can you believe he was once a bloody Yankee? 
Now he's a man of men. And as he says this, the sheep herders do whatever and win. He's a man of men, and the sheep herders have another win. And then he cuts his promo about NASA Stadium. They're going to defend the UWF tag titles against the Lightning Express. And then the next day, we're going to be a Starcade. Why? They're not on the show, mind you. But the best tag teams in the world are going to be there. They're going to scout everyone. They're going to watch the Road Warriors. They're going to watch the Horsemen. They're going to watch the Banana Express. They're going to watch the Rock and Roll Express. And afterwards, we're going to take all of them on, any one of them, or hell, just send them all. That's fine with us. He was incredible. Amazing. Just amazing. Incredible. These are the goddamn bushwhackers. I know. What the fuck? And I'm sure they made more money as the bushwhackers than they ever did as the sheep herders. Now, now listen, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, I'm sure he's a nice guy and all, but, you know, Terry Taylor went to WWF and he became the Red Rooster. Mm -hmm. Big fucking scandal at the time. I know. I watch him now, and I'm like, I'd have made him a fucking cock, too. What's the problem? But these sheep herders becoming the bushwhackers, I mean, how did Vince not go out of business? I don't know. He's a fucking idiot. <laughs> Someone, I guess they didn't. They weren't totally mute, but just give these guys a mic and get out of the way. Dude, have them be the sheep herders. All they, all these they ever did. These goofy dingbats licking people's heads. All they did was come out and march and and and, and do and comedy, lick heads, and do goofy comedy, and do and do their one move because their matches were good too. Just get in there and beat the shit out of people. That's all I want. Like if you go back and watch these shows, it's like they took these guys and turned them into two Santinos. Yeah, that's that's exactly what happened. Disgusted. Speaking of disgust, actually, wait. Let's hold that thought. The Rock and Roll Express got a promo. <laughs> well, Robert starts. <laughs> And Ricky literally cut him off in the middle of his deal and did all the talking. And it wasn't even... I've seen a lot of really terrible Robert gives some promos. This wasn't one of them. This was merely bad. I didn't hear a word he said. He just mumbled. That's all he ever does. But there's somewhere it's worse. But yes, Ricky Morton did just jump in and, and save the day. And it made you wonder, again, why they even bother giving Gibson a mic. Now, speaking of disgust... Before you even begin, in hindsight... Was this not the perfect main event for this fucking show? Fair point. <laughs> Was it not? Because usually you see, you start with an interesting match and then build, and the show gets more and more interesting, and then the main event is the best. This show, you, you had one digger and dig jobber deep, after another, dig deeper and deeper into the depths of hell, and here we have reached the Earth's core. The Jive Tones versus the Menace and Alan Martin. Yes. Okay. The Jive Tones, for those of you who don't know, which I'm assuming is pretty much Everybody. all of you, it's Shaska Watley, who was on this show a year ago in Paul Jones' army. Yeah, what happened? He left, and now he, he's back. Sh Shaska Watley and Tiger Conway Jr. versus The Menace, which is who the hell knows, and Alan Martin, a guy who's out here doing jobs every week. So when I had ter determined... That there was a three-way tie for the worst wrestler of all time of the week. I was referring to the three men in this match who were not Alan Martin. Yeah. Alan Martin was Shawn Michaels' <laughs> is prime compared to these other fuckers here. Shaska Wadley and Tiger <sighs> Conway were so horrible. They couldn't do anything right. They fucked And you up know what? It wasn't the jobber's fault. No! It was their fault. I think the menace was better than either Shaska Wally or Tiger Conway. There was a point where they tried a double team, and he took a horrible bump, and you shouted, that's the, I forget what you said, that's a horrible bump by that jobber. And I said, no, no, it wasn't his fault. And you were confused until a minute later, they tried the move a second time, and you realized how badly they had fucked up the first time. Yeah. I mean, it was a bad bump. It was a horrible bump. Let's be fair. But it wasn't his fault. But when he comes off the ropes, and here's one of them throwing a back elbow, <laughs> and the other one doing a drop toe hold, what the fuck's he supposed to do? So he melted. He just melted. They fucked that up. They're in there with Alan Martin, who again is on here every week. He's a total professional. Let me try to explain how they fucked this up, or how he fucked up the bump, okay? <laughs> one guy, they're, they're trying to do a double drop toe hold, okay? This is what I think happened. Okay. So he's expecting a double drop toe hold. One guy does a drop toe hold. The other guy is doing the elbow, okay? Mm -hmm. So he can't just fall flat because there's an elbow in the way. That's true. So instead, like, he falls to his knees. And then, because it's supposed to be a drop toe hold, he overcompensates and he drives his own head into the mat. Is that not what happened? 
I'm not even sure. <laughs> he like <laughs> fell to his knees and then just goes <laughs> head first planted into the fucking mat. It was so bad. So And yes, you know what? They did it again. They, they tried to... Now hold on for a second. Okay. This is not like you fuck up a four fifty and you gotta get your shit in. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's a double drop toe hold. They were like, well, goddamn, we fucked it up. We better do it again. These people pay to see the jive tones. They pay, they pay to, to see, see a, a double, double drop, drop toe hold. hold. Fuck. Now, before all that, because <laughs> make no mistake, this was a piece of shit match before all of that. Alan Martin here, as I heard, being a professional wrestler every week. He does his job to the best of his ability to make the stars look like stars. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, but no one ever has a problem with him. How many times did the jive tones almost kill him? Like three times, they picked him for a body slam and dropped him right on his head. They go for a suplex and drop him right on his head. They go for a punch and hit him right in the face. They just murdered him. Finally, he tagged out to the menace. Then we had all that horrible shit. And the finish is a double Russian leg sweep. They fucked that up, too. Their own finish. Yeah, which I thought was the exclusive company of the Headbangers. Or, excuse me, property <laughs> or uh, Jinder Mahal. Sure. Tony, who is not a astute wrestling fan, but he watched them do this move and asked, how do they not break all their own elbows? I didn't have an answer for the man. They won with this terrible move. A, a, a unbelievably horrific match. An atrocity. You know what, though? When it was over, I couldn't wait. I could not wait to see Ron Simmons get his <laughs> hands on Shaska Watley and Tiger Conway. I'd buy a ticket right now to it's, see that match. It's going to be a beating. They fucked up the, the, with Ron like they did with this guy? No good. So they cut a Maybe promo. that's why we haven't heard of the Jive Tones. Ron Simmons murdered them? <laughs> Maybe they're, they were killed in that match with Ron Simmons. I have no better explanation. They cut a promo. They run down Simmons and also Dusty Rhodes and also Ronnie Garvin. Ric Flair, they said, is going to make the hands of stone look like the hands of cotton. That was how the show ended. Hey, a terrible let's note. be fair. At least Shaska could talk. He was a good pro. The promo was much better than the match. I agree. Yes. That was your main event, everybody. You know, there's another one. Remember we used to watch Shaska Watley when he was with Paul Jones, and we were like, how did they screw this guy up and make him Pez Watley jobber? Like, this is so wrong. I've changed my mind. He was in fact terrible. <laughs> that him being a jobber on WWE TV, like that was that was just I don't know. So let's get fucking like a monkey. Once a week, you got a raw show. You got a meeting scheduled at nine thirty. I mean, yes. come on. Yeah. All right, let's get going. So uh, NWA World Championship Wrestling, November twenty first, nineteen eighty seven. As noted, no David Crockett. So Dusty Rhodes comes out for a promo. Tony called him Stardust. Maybe he was which, in the middle of selling the company. Because that's coming. That is. So yeah, I, I, I knew Stardust was Dusty's promo going way back, but it is funny considering you know his son was Stardust for a while. Yes. Dusty hyped up the New York card, hyped up Starcade, and said he would be entering the bunkhouse stampede with a U.S. title around his waist. That's right. New Breed versus David Isley and Terry Jones. So... Chris Champion was out for a long time with a busted arm, and now he's back with a cast on the arm and circuitry in it, because he's from the future. Yes. And he has a futuristic cast that will make his arm heal better. Which, by the way, this futuristic cast has been on his arm for a long time. That's true. Like, if he would have had a real cast, he'd be healed by now. It's so, it. I don't know what... I mean, I'm thinking this might be a gimmick that he hits people with. Oh, come on now. Yeah. Well, he uh, used the bionic cast when, uh, I believe it was Terry Jones threw a punch and Champion caught it and squeezed yes. his fist nearly to the point of submission. Yes. Royal gets in there, fucks up a sharpshooter, shouts, come on, you sheeps. He's referring to the sheep herders. Yes. Why? Well, they've... Because. I mean, this is not on Starcade. Is on the, was it a dark match? I don't know. I don't think so. They, they called him out last week, too. So everyone, hey, you know what? After c compared to uh, the Kevin Sullivan's, Ricky Santana's, who just come in here and talk about everybody else, if they're just going into business for themselves and trying to book a program with the Sheep Herders, great. And if I recall correctly, there's another match that they hyped up last week that was only aired 
in one city on closed circuit. What was it? I think you remember talking about that. Regardless, the new breed here won with the elevated leg variant. And then they cut a promo where they just pretended to be the sheep herders. And I couldn't help but notice they are way more entertaining and interesting when they're imitating the sheep herders. The Mighty Wilbur match. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. They, they plugged that last week and it wasn't, I mean, it was in one city. And now maybe this is going to be in one city for all I know. So the new breed, I realize it's too late to tell them this unless they're still in the future at this point. But uh, they need to be from the New Zealand of 2002 because they're much more fun that way. And the champion at the very end, he steps forward to shout into the camera and Tony has to follow him and hold the mic over his shoulder, and Tony was so annoyed by this. So, Sean Royal is not good for much, like anything, okay. but he can do a great impersonation of the Sheep Herders. Yeah. So, I got to give the guy that. So, what Champion vowed at the end was they were going to win 2002 style. Okay. Does anyone remember the year 2002 in professional wrestling? It was just about the worst year in the history of wrestling. ECW was dead. Yeah. WCW had died. Yeah. WWE screwed up the invasion. Everybody stopped watching. That's where these guys are from. It all makes sense now. <laughs> they, are, they were like, we got to get out of here. Every bit is we got to go back in time. I mean, think about it. In 2002, if you could go back in time, I mean, you go back to 87 Crockett. I would. That's where I'd go. Yeah. So they had it right. I think 2002 was the build-up to the Triple H Scott Steiner Royal Rumble match, which was very bad, as you recall. That's the one thing you can remember that was bad in 2002. That's a lot of bad. How about everything? Okay. JJ Dillon and Lex Luger came out for a promo. They claimed they had flown to New York merely to visit the stadium or the arena. Mm. Where the show will be held next week. Well, this is where history will be made. Dusty Rhodes will retire for 90 full days. No, that's a Starcade. Oh. They're talking about the uh, New York right. show. Yeah. The New York show. That's right. I'm sorry. So they plugged War Games, which JJ was sure to call the original Survivor Series. And then they go to Lex. I don't know what got into Lex this week. He was good. He was energetic. Yeah. He, I'm not sure he inhaled. His entire promo was shouting as loud and as fast as he could. You call yourself a legend? Well, I'm going to be at the legend. Over and over and over and over. Again. He's he's hit and miss, but he was he was on. He was certainly not boring. No, it was not boring. Mike Rotundo versus Tommy Angel. So I think it was with you. I'm virtually certain that it was with you. We were talking about Bo and Bray and how fat they are. Okay. And I brought up I brought up Mike I brought up IRS actually is what I called him. Oh, the family tree. Yes. yes. I once, yes. And you were like saying, well, you know, he was he was a little chunky or whatever. Mike Rotundo is in fine shape here. At this point, absolutely. And I was thinking about this. Like, he's no Lex Luger, but he's in way better shape than Bo Dallas. Yes. He's in way better shape than Bray Wyatt. Yes. What is their excuse? And I was thinking, I actually wrote, it's not like they're Rikishi's sons. And then I remembered who Rikishi's sons are. They're the Usos. Yeah. Way better shape than Bo and Bray. That's also true. Why are they so fat? Well, you'd have to ask them. But Mike Rotundo, as noted, was in very good shape here. His last name was Rotundo. <laughs> it's right there, Rotunda. But he wasn't. No. At the point. children are. He got fatter later. He got a little fatter, but he wasn't like he wasn't like Rotundo. He was not Rikishi. No. No. Regardless, here he had a very even back and forth technical wrestling matchup with Tommy Angel for three or four minutes, and in the in the end, he hit the airplane spin and he won. Not much to write about. That's all I've got. Not much. Heavy Starcade Control Center. With Magnum TA. Magnum TA, my, my biggest takeaway from this is obviously Magnum has a very successful pro wrestler who was, you know, uh, forced to retire right when he was about to hit his peak. It was very sad, but the good news is at this point he has transitioned into being a very good TV guy. Sure, but he wasn't like, he wasn't like a super regular. Like if it were WWE today and he was one of their big stars, like if he were Randy Orton. He got in a terrible accident. He could never wrestle again. Like if Randy Orton wanted to, he'd have been. He could have a commentary job for the rest of his life. Yes. Like if this were today and Magnum were in WWE, he'd have a commentary job for the rest of his life. They put him in a suit. Mm -hmm. you, you can't see that he's lost a ton of weight. He's in a chair, so you can't see that his arm doesn't work. He doesn't have to walk. Great talker. Yeah, he doesn't have to to walk. I mean, he looked great. Yeah. Sounded great. Sounded great. Did all of his predictions. Mm -hmm. So he ran through the. He, he did do his predictions here. They, at first, they showed clips of. Actually, let's go back to the very beginning. 
First, they asked what a, uh, what it meant to be at Starcade. And he talked about what an honor it was just to be invited to that show. But then once you get there, success or failure on that show can make or break your career. Mm. It's very important. And they show clips of his most famous match, the cage match against Tully Blanchard. By clips, you mean literally about 10 seconds of this match. Yeah, it was They're a like, clip. Here are some clips of your, your legendary I Quid match with Tully Blanchard. Clip. Done. You know, because you had a little more than that. <laughs> they could have they, it, two hours. They didn't have a two-hour show. They could have shown. They could have shown more. I mean, wouldn't that make you excited for Starcade to see that? Think, to think about how great Starcade. Yeah. Is, have a Starcade match. Legendary Starcade match. So here we go. Magnum TA's predictions. Yes. I hope you all write these down and compare to the actual results. Why? I, I do. I have all of the results. I won't give you. I won't tell you who won. Okay. But I'll just tell you how he did in his predictions. I see. Well, why don't I'll run down the predictions? So you get the final tally. Yes. Okay. Picked Michael Hayes, Jimmy Garvin, and Sting. The newcomer Sting, he says. The newcomer Sting to defeat uh, Larry Zabisco, Eddie Gilbert, and Rick Steiner in the six man. Yep. Said Steve Williams would beat Barry Windham to retain the UWF title. He said, I'm very good friends with both men, but Dr. Death has a slight edge. <laughs> nice way to put it. It has. <laughs> he said the Midnight Express would beat the Rock and Roll Express in the scaffold match due to Big Bubba Rogers' interference. Mm. He's going to climb the scaffold? Apparently. Good luck with that. So, Tony's, you know, ask, rattling that off a list of matches, and he says... Nikita Koloff versus Terry Taylor in the TV title unification match. And Magnum smirks. That's almost humorous. The NWA is always the best. Nikita Koloff's going to win. He was disgusted even after to answer that question. He was, he was insulted for sure. How can you even ask? The, NWO is the, or the NWA is the best. Of course our man's going to win. His biggest surprise, I think. Well, one of them. He said, Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson, the best defensive team I've ever seen, he says, mm. would retain the tag team titles over the Road Warriors in their hometown. Well, you know, he feuded with Tully. Yes, he did. This man would know. And he faced the Road Warriors in the finals of the first Crockett Cups. That's right. Yep. And then the real biggest surprise, he didn't really pick a winner in Lex Luger versus Dusty Rhodes, but if you break down what he said... You could tell he thought Lex was going to win and just didn't have the heart to say it about his old friend. So the young lion, Lex Luger, would come out, would be uh, too hard to stop. And finally, Ronnie Garvin would retain the world title over Ric Flair. So for the record, everybody, he got three of his predictions right. Out of nine? Out of seven. Three out of seven. And it's funny because as, as he starts giving his predictions, I'm like, he's going to get everyone right. And then I went back later and I thought, man, he only got three of them right. I just expected him to pick every single baby face. No. No, he's, he's got to have his credibility because he's he doing commentary he for does. the show. And it's a sport. Yes. You must admit that the, your best friends can be beaten. Now, later, there were heels that picked all the heels. Yes. But he's, he must. Because he they did must, not need credibility. Yes, maintain his credibility. Yeah, Magnum was very good here. Sting versus Cougar J. These fans adore everything that Sting does. Yeah. You know, I was thinking, like, Sting, I thought that Sting was a Hall of Famer. It was a big debate. Is he a Wrestling Observer Hall of Famer or not? He finally goes in. And you watch Sting, and Sting was never, like, great. Like, he had some great matches, but he was never, like, a great wrestler. You never put him in, like, you know, he was like a flair. He was uh, never the wrestler of the year. No, nothing like that. And I don't know anything about the guy. I could be reading too much into this, but I saw a young guy here who's in great shape. Mm -hmm. He's just started. He's very green. There's some things that he can do that look good. Mm -hmm. You know, stinger splash, the big overhead press, and all of this other stuff. And the fans absolutely, completely adore the guy. What was his incentive to get better? <laughs> you know what point? I mean? Yeah. He was a star. He did just enough. Mm -hmm. Why? What was his motivation? No, that's a great point. He was already, That's all I saw during this match. He was arguably the most popular guy on the show, outside of like a Dusty. Uh, they, they absolutely, of all the guys who actually wrestled, they loved him more than anyone. I did find it funny. Sting's, uh, not his first great rivalry, but one of his most famous rival, rivalries was with Vader. Here, Sting did a Vader bomb. Yeah. And he kept on wrestling. Kind of sloppy, but it didn't matter. Everyone loved him. He won with a stinger splash. And he gets to cut his promo. Oh, my God. Another great, crazy sting promo. You know he... what he reminded me of? He reminded me of John Cena. Well? 
They, I mean, you know, they have a similar physique, similar haircut. But the thing that reminded me of John Cena was he had some really stupid dialogue, but he was so over that it didn't matter. There's so much energy and charisma. He's calling Eddie Gilbert hot puff. Yeah, hot puff Eddie Gilbert. This More is than death. once. This is absolute death. But every time he said it, the place would go crazy. The other thing about uh, that, that that's similar to Cena is that uh, there was a bit of humanity to him and that he was not afraid to acknowledge when he screwed something up. Sure. He'd fumble over a line or lose his place and he'd just stop and he'd slap the mat or he'd howl. Ah! They'd all get into it. Like, it was better that way. So not he, as good as Dr. Death later. <laughs> but uh, he, <laughs> he, did, he did a very good job when things weren't going his way. So he called out Hot Puff, said he was not afraid to lower himself to Gilbert's level. His good friend Dr. Death had brought him a new hold from Japan, the Scorpion. Worked out well. Man, he, sure did. He promised to use it on Gilbert and Larry Zabisco. He's just screaming randomly. And every time he every time he did it, people loved him more. And then the last thing he said is like, Rick Steiner, you've got no brains and very little brawn. Well, that's just a lie. That is an absolute <laughs> lie. <laughs> Barry Windham appeared for a promo. Nothing to say. He very quickly mentioned Steve Williams in the UWF title and then said Larry Zabisco could get a Western States title shot whenever he wanted. Kevin Sullivan versus Alan Martin. You know what I noticed during this match? What's that? Kevin Sullivan, at one point, gets on the middle rope, and he does a karate chop. Yeah. Where's Jinder's chop? (laughs) I've named an entire year-long segment. After his chop. After his chop that he did on one show. Yes. That AJ Styles match in December. Well. He has never done it since. Think about this. He lost the match. I know, but come on. It's like the only good thing he did in all of 2017. Well, could have been that good. He lost the match. And he's taken it out of the... the, He must figure, had I not done that stupid chop, I would still be world champion to this day. That chop did not lead to the finish, Vinny. I know. And that chop was effective when he did it. Hmm. I was disgusted. I watched Kevin Sullivan go up there, and I'm I'm pretty dang sure that he wanted Alan Martin to stay down. And he, he did gets, the Grand Naniwa rope walk, basically, and yeah. then chopped him. Yes, he he gets up, and Martin's like halfway bent over, and Sullivan Sullivan is like, uh, hmm, and he did that. Sullivan, uh, you know what I noticed in this match? Kevin Sullivan's legs are enormous. Well, so is his gut. Well, and yeah, his, his trunks were like you know rolling down. I he kept. Trying to pull, I'm pretty Ugh. sure the drawstring to his trunks broke. It was, it was, was exceedingly unflattering. His cardio was not the best. He, he was a powerful man, not necessarily lean. He lifted a lot of weights. He sure did. And not a lot of reps. He did just enough to jump up in the air and come down with both feet on Martin and pin him. Yeah. So they go to commercial, and every time they go to commercial, there is the same music and the same graphic, and there's a clip from the last match in slow-mo, and then some wacky catchphrase, like a fortune cookie almost, at the bottom. What, the catchphrase at this time said, May I point out the NWA is the best in wrestling? Yeah. If only they knew what was to come on this show. Well, you know, you got to take the good with the bad. Steve Williams versus Thunderfoot number two. This was the good. Eventually. You know what I loved about this is, nowadays, the German suplex where he dropped the guy into his head, it's like a spot. Oh, my God, he dropped him on his head. And, like, sometimes the guy will sell his neck and be down for a long time. Sometimes the guy will jump up and fire up and everything like that. Dr. Death gives Thunderfoot. This is Thunderfoot number two, not a main eventer. No. He gives his jobber a German suplex, and he lifts him up, and it's a high angle, and this Thunderfoot lands right on his neck. Just gets up. Yes. Locks up again. What? (laughs) Well, there was that. Then there was the fact that I think Williams watched the Mike Rotundo match and thought, I'm going to go out there and have a good wrestling match, too. And he tried to have an amateur wrestling match with Thunderfoot number two. So they do this spot. <laughs> it is unbelievable. Dr. Death has him in a side headlock on the mat. The Thunderfoot grabs Dr. Death around the waist, and he tries to bridge him over to you know do the cradle, and then Dr. Death will just come back into the headlock again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, he tries to pull him over. Dr. Death doesn't go. Thunderfoot's like, oh, no, I'm pulling you over, buddy. And he pulls with all of his might. And he finally, it's like a shoot. He finally gets Dr. Death over. But Dr. Death's legs go a little bit too far. So, Dr. Death can't bring himself back the other way to get the headlock again. So, instead, 
He keeps going and does a shoot on the mad headlock takeover and flips Thunderfoot back over again. Yes. This was like a shoot. Well, in that aspect, I guess it was good. I, I thought it was just, no, it wasn't good. Okay, it was enjoyable, entertaining, notable. It was, it was, it was, it was realistic. There you go. Which is not always good. <laughs> Eventually, Williams gave up on the wrestling match, just started powerhousing the guy around, hit the press slam, the running backdrop, and the power slam, and won. I thought this match was amazing. Well, that's, that's I can I can see why you would say that. Then, then the promo. He goes to join Tony at the announce desk, and Tony says, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Death Steve Williams, or whatever. He holds out the mic, and Steve says, clear as day, excuse me, everyone, there is a piece of hair in my mouth. Excuse me, Tony, I had a piece of hair in my mouth. Yes. And if you saw his head, there's a lot of long hair there. This is not like he said it clearly, as in, you know, he says it off mic, but you can kind of hear him. Yeah. He... Grabs the mic, he looks right at Tony and says, Excuse me, Tony, I had a piece of hair in my mouth. He said it the way Miz says, I'm awesome. Yeah. <laughs> just shouts it right into the camera. Then he goes into his promo. He says, This match with Wyndham is going to be just like when Oklahoma played Nebraska in football. It's two great uh, a- two great athletes. One of them's got to win. Only one can win. Either way, I'm going to shake your hand after the match. Now, it could be amateur wrestling. It could be a bar fight. I know everything about it. I know everything about both of them. But this is going to be a wrestling match. And oh, by the way, my money is on the dream. And he winked. He did note that him and Barry Windham were like friends. He did say that. He didn't say we are friends. He said we're like friends. And it was funny the way that he did his Dusty Rhodes thing. He says, whether it's a bar fight or a wrestling match, and it'll be a wrestling match, my money is on Dusty Rhodes. It was... Maybe they gave him the wrap-up signal and he wasn't expecting it. I don't know. I guess. He was, there was de- definitely a wacky man. So here comes Ricky Santana. Hey, let's get the positive out of the way first. The man looked like a star. Okay. Dressed like a star. Mm-hmm. Talked like a star. Sure. Thank God he was not in the ring. There was nothing wrong with anything he did here. No. He comes out. He does what he always does. Thanks the fans. Thanks, Tony, for having, on, having him on there. He said... Again, I predict Dusty Rhodes will beat Lex Luger. I predict Ronnie Garvin will beat Ric Flair. He spoke in Spanish for a while, but not so long to the point where he got booed. Thanked everyone again, and that was that. And he was done. It was fine. But for weeks now, he's been calling... Not even calling out. He's been talking about Ric Flair. And Ric Flair has been warning him, don't talk about me. And he comes out here on the go-home show for Starcade. You talk about dressing like a star. Let's list in detail what he was wearing. White jeans. White buttoned-up shirt. Excellent. And Shows a, off the tan. A jacket that was either white or maybe carnation. It's kind of hard to tell in the light. Regardless, this was an outfit meant to be bled on. And I was so giddy, looking forward to Ric Flair and the Go Home Show for Starcade murdering this man. No. And it never happened. Don't get ahead of yourself, Vinny. They're going to do Ric Flair as world champion versus Ricky Santana? Well, I mean, they'd have to. I guess so. the show's Thursday. Yeah. So apparently, okay, good for Ricky then. Regardless, I was expecting a massacre on the show, and I didn't get it, and it left me a little bummed. So for the record, we had Ricky Santana followed Mm -hmm. by Ricky Steiner versus Ricky Nelson. And Ricky Santana was talking about Ric Flair. Yeah. Yeah. There's too many Ricks. So Rick, well, I I must... (laughs) Only one of these men should be allowed to be named Rick. And it ain't Flair tonight. I will allow it for this night... Because Rick Steiner versus Ricky Nelson was awesome. Mainly because Rick Steiner killed this guy. You know, I said this on Twitter, and I stand by this. This 1987 Rick Steiner was scarier than 1999 Scott Steiner. I'm going to tell you why. Because 1999 Scott Steiner was in like his late 30s, early 40s. Yes. You believed he could probably kill anybody. But there was always that thought that maybe he's going to tear something or maybe he's going to get blown up. He was already losing significant mobility. Sure. Rick Steiner here, he'd have killed anybody. Bears. This was the scariest dude I ever saw in my life. He germined this poor little fool, as you noted, Ricky Nelson, right on his head. Ricky Nelson, unlike the Thunderfoot, did not leap to his feet. He was dead. He was killed. Rick gave him the most incredible power slam you've ever seen in your life. 
just flipped him 80 miles an hour and just slammed him down into the mat. Nelson's coming at him off the ropes, and Rick goes for the, the twisting power slam that Randy Orton and a million other guys do. He throws him into the air. He had to grab him to stop him from flying out of the ring. Yes. And they you know, just slammed him down. And the impact, it was like in the in the 80s when they had those those uh, commercials of like cars running into a brick wall and the dummy is not in a seatbelt. Yes. That's what this was here. This yes. guy should have buckled up for this You power should slam. wear a seatbelt when wrestling Rick Steiner. I can't recommend that strongly enough. He beat him, beat him, beat him. Looked like he was having the time of his life destroyed. He was. <laughs> and who wouldn't? I was. And I wasn't even beating up Rick Eventually, Nelson. he won with a belly-to-belly. Very good squash match. He's wearing one black boot and one white boot. He, he, he did which that? Which the Steiners did, because they would just switch boots. Yeah. Apparently, Rick did his entire career. Well, what was amazing was, Scott was wrestling at this point. Okay. I just always had this idea that they just broke in as a team together. Wrong. No, I, I, they did their own thing for like three years before they finally became a team. Scott was, a, I, he was in Memphis for a while. Yeah. Yeah. And... No, it's, it's still, in fact, from here, it's still like two or three years, I think. It was 89. Oh, two so years. two years, yeah. yeah. Sullivan came out for a promo. Who the hell does Ricky Santana think he is questioning Ric Flair? Lex Luger, you have no chance against Dusty Rhodes. You better get two machetes and a saber in your mouth. That was a great line. And finally, he said Steve Williams was a total wrestling machine, and he would show that he was a man and Barry Windham was still a boy. And that was it. Midnight Express versus Rex King and Max MacGyver. Can add Bobby Eaton to the list of men who do the skull-crushing finale better than The Miz. Oh, no. You mentioned his name. I did earlier. Anyway, finish. So the Express beat them up. You can see they were just openly experimenting with some, with some new double teams. They may have made them up on the spot. And then they won with a rocket launcher. All right, so The Miz. I'm going to keep this quick. Everyone's sick of us talking about The Miz, but listen to me. Jim Cornette does a promo about the scaffold match. And I've, I've mentioned many times, I think Miz is a great talker. He is not a great promo. I bring up things where he goes like, I'm the greatest intercontinental champion of all time. I've brought prestige back to this belt. Okay, listen, I grew up in the early 90s. You have not brought the intercontinental title back to where it was in the early 90s. And then people go, well, he's full of it. He's a heel. Okay, listen, Jim Cornette's a heel here. Jim Cornette is cutting a promo about the scaffold match at Starcade with the Rock and Roll Express. Mm -hmm. This is a deadly serious promo. He is explaining this is the deadliest match in the history of wrestling. These guys are going up on this scaffold. Guys could be thrown off. Can you look into a guy's eyes and throw him off a 20-foot scaffold? Maybe to his death. This man has feelings. This man has a family. He is pushing this as a deadly serious match. And you, the viewer, are like... Someone could die on Thursday. Like, this is a real deal, legit, heel, big-time, money-drawing promo. This is not going out there and talking all, you know, whatever, and he wasn't just being for the sake full of it, of it yeah. and, you know, good enunciation. This was a great heel promo. That's how it's done. Talked about how people questioned why they would be in a War Games match the night before Starcade, and he says, well, our only goal in War Games is to take out the rock and rolls, injure them, bump, uh, you know, hurt their arm, hurt their leg, hurt their back, so they're not at 100% going to that scaffold match. Because the scaffold match is mostly luck, he says, but we're going to make our own luck. And yes, he questioned if the rock and roll express had the killer instinct it would take to throw a man off the scaffold, knowing he would never be the same again. Didn't they basically throw him off the scaffold? No, it was Road Warriors. Oh, that's right, it was no. the Road Warriors. Yeah who do have the killer instinct, and no yes. one ever questioned them. <laughs> yeah, we find that out later. Yeah. Flair came out for a promo. <laughs> so he starts talking, mm -hmm. and then they just cut away for a danger zone. Well, he's, he was pushing the tape. I see. He was, he's, got, he's got the VHS tape in one hand, and the swimsuit calendar in the other hand, which he was open to Missy Hyatt because he wants people to buy it. Yeah, it's like a swimsuit <laughs> calendar with dudes. Eleven dudes and, and Missy, Missy Hyatt. Hyatt. Yeah. If you want a swimsuit, if you want to know what Steve, uh, Steve Williams and Jimmy Garvin looked like in their Speedos, they got the calendar for you. I mean, don't we see that every week? Pretty close. <laughs> it's like, take your boots What's off. What's the difference? Yeah. So, they showed, I guess, clips from the tape. There's promos. There's wrestling action. And there's fans talking about how great it was. And then it's only twenty four ninety five. dollars well, First off, we have to review this. <laughs> the Danger Zone? Magnum TA and Missy Hyatt host this thing. Okay? They did, in fact, say, 
This Danger Zone video cassette is available on VHS or Beta. Oh. For the low, low price of twenty four ninety five plus four ninety five shipping and handling. That's right. I forgot the shipping and handling. That's like a thousand dollars in today's money. <laughs> now I'm only being uh, mildly sarcastic. I actually found out. Do you know how much this was worth in today's money back then? How much, Brian? In two thousand eighteen dollars, would this have been worth sixty two dollars and ninety two cents for a one hour <laughs> video cassette and a calendar with eleven wrestlers and Missy Hyatt? And as far as I can tell, it's not even full matches. It's just interviews and promos, because the fans are talking about how it's great to get to know these guys as people. So think of the value you get for $8 a month, getting at least 12 hours of the Brian and Video Show at yes. video.f4wonline.com. Yes. This is a real deal. $64 or sixty two ninety two. I got to get this exact. I don't want to over-exaggerate. No. They were asking you for $62.92 to get this tape delivered to your house. An hour! A one-hour videotape. Video cassette. Yes. So they go to break, and they come back, and Flair is still out there. And now he's he's pushed the video. He can talk about whatever he wants to now. Says there's monkeys in the crowd dressed like Dusty and studs in the crowd dressed like Flair. And he says, all right, enough of the fans. Let's talk about me. Says Magnum had been out there to give him predictions. Who's Magnum to predict his match? Magnum's only claim to fame is that I carried him to a great match for 60 minutes when I could have beat him whenever I wanted. And here's Ricky Santana in his $9 outfit talking about my life. He assured Ricky his life was built around fast women, fast cars, and the winner's circle. Says Ronnie Garvin's been walking around with his world title. This is not the people's belt, he says. It's my belt. Yes. And he says, on Chicago, in Chicago, Garvin's going to be mine all night long. And then he talked about New York, said the NWA was going to take over. The Road Warriors versus Dale Laparus and Curtis Thompson. I got to say, I got to get it out of the way. If we're wrong about who's Dale Laparus, I want to apologize to the other guy. I'm pretty sure we got Dale Laparus right. I recall Dale Laparus being horrible. We haven't seen him in a long time. He was the absolute worst. For now. I mean, he had the worst, he had the worst hair that you can have and have a full head of hair. You know what I mean? It was awful. Like, usually, like, a guy's losing some of his hair, but he's got the bald eagle mullet, or he's got some goofy... This guy had a full head of hair, yeah. and it was the worst haircut, and that's coming from me. It was the bold... You know how many bad haircuts I've had in my life? More than just about anybody. Dale Laparus. The parted down the middle bowl cut mullet. Oh. The wispy mustache to go with it. An appalling mustache. <laughs> He's tall and gangly. Not like skinny, gangly. Nothing There's resembling a, a physique. No. And you know, we watch a lot of weird shit in wrestling. We see minis versus grown men. We watch 300-pound men fight women in Lucha Underground. I have never seen something that made me say, this should be illegal. Dale yeah. Epperus should not be allowed to wrestle the Road Warriors. The commissions no. have stepped in and said, this is not fair. No. Someone's going to get hurt. And someone did get hurt, and it was Dale Laparus. They killed him. Hit, they didn't even hit their move on him. They were uh, He would have died for sure. If they had hit the doomsday device on him, he'd have hit the mat, and his arms and legs and head would have all fallen off. So they hit sandwich lariats instead and pinned him. They cut Which a may have meant that like he couldn't take that move. Neither of them. That's what I'm thinking. Dude. So they cut a promo, said they had never been NWA World Tag Team Champions. There's no better place than their hometown of Chicago for the belts to change hands. Hawk says, you know, promoters pay Big money for people to do stupid things. And these guys are paying the horse and the biggest money of all to do the stupidest thing of all, and that's get in the ring with us. That was a great promo. That was a great promo. Hawk is Hawk is more missed than hit, but this was a hit. Larry Zabisco versus Larry Stevens. Four Ricks later, and they got two Larrys that have to be in the same segment here. Yeah. Larry was pretty good in this match. He was. This was he looked pretty good in this squash. He did a little stalling. Not but, a ton. No, nah, I mean, it just he yelled at the people and yelled he, at the ref. He, he gave and, the guy a chance to uh, to back out of the match. Yeah. Then he beat him up and says, I gave you a chance, brother, and continued to beat him up. Yes. And eventually he won with the, uh, it was a sloppy neck breaker. I will assume that is Larry Stevens' fault. Tony claimed, and I quote, <laughs> he almost jerked his head right out of the socket. Yes. That's a serious neck breaker. It is. He almost jerked the guy's head out of his, what, the neck socket? The head socket. Uh. 
I didn't know you had one of those. I guess the head must connect to something. There must be a socket. The neck bone, I'd always heard. connects to the neck. The head bone connects to the neck bone. I was unaware there was a socket. Maybe that song wasn't accurate. So they go to commercial and they come back. I mean, it's pretty accurate. Okay. And Larry and Baby Doll's amazing 1980s outfit. Kind of promo. She's out there in black spandex pants and a black spandex top with a big, thick gold belt like a championship around her waist and a white, like a shawl over on top of it. And of course, her hair is just teased out to the heavens. So Larry is also insulted that Magnum has picked him to lose at Starcade. So if you look across the ring, I see two guys who think they're in a rock band and one guy playing trick or treat. Says Starcade is the deadline for Barry Windham to surrender the Western States Heritage Championship. If he doesn't, he doesn't surrender it to Larry or Baby Doll at Starcade. Then Larry's going to come and get it. <laughs> Said Barry had one weakness as a wrestler, and that's that he was too tall. Well, he said he had weaknesses. He had he had many weaknesses. He's learned from Baby Doll. And yeah, he's yeah. going to give him a hint. One, he is too tall and thus has no leverage. That's right. And two, he's too tall and thus has no speed. I see. Okay, hold on a second. So if I had a car, okay, and I had to lift the car, mm-hmm. okay, and I had a boulder, you got this? I think so. Okay. So if I took a really, 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 really long board mm-hmm. and put one end of the car and one end over here and the boulder in the middle, I mean, maybe I could use that leverage to lift the car. But if I had a really short board mm-hmm. and the boulder very close, there's no way I'm lifting the car. Okay, what I- is Larry talking about here? I'm not going to... You're right, Brian. About Thank your, your, you. Your, your car, boulder, board analogy. Thank you're you. You're right. You were on the longest board Thank possible. Thank you. That was on my black belt test. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. There's a written portion about leverage. So... Larry threatens to go through Barry Windham, Nikita Koloff, and Dusty Rose to get a world championship title shot. Nothing we've said on this show is worse than this next match. Nothing I've done in my life is worse than this next match. If you thought the Jive Tones were bad last week... Actually, you know what? Let me take that back. If you thought Tiger Conway Jr. was bad <laughs> last week... We had the Jive Tones versus El Negro and B.T. Washington. Now, if this... A, a good chunk of this match was Tiger Conway Jr. versus B.T. Washington. Oh. If it had just been those two men... Singles match? In a singles match, this may well have been the worst match I've ever seen. Yes. This was Shelly Martinez bad when those two were in there together. Now, El Negro was significantly less horrible than B.T. Washington. He was no good, but he was better. And Shaska Watley, when he was in there, appeared to be completely competent. He was was very bad last week, but he was up to his game here. With that said, this was still the worst tag match. It had to be the worst tag match of 2018. Like, if if it happened today, there's no way anything could be worse. I thought you were going to say of all time. Well, I mean... It's up there. It probably is up there, but... I'm trying to think of really, really terrible two-on-two tag team matches. Heroes of Wrestling. Iron Sheik and Volkov versus the Bushwhackers. Yep. That's one. I was going to say Chronic Against versus... the Sheep Herders. Can yeah. you even imagine? Or the Sheep Herders of 98. Oh, my God. Undertaker and Kane versus Chronic. Also quite terrible. Yeah. One worst match of the year. Yeah. And much longer. So I mean, this this would... If this happened in 2018, it would win worst match of the year. I think so. I mean, unquestionably. Like, I've said lots of... Many, many times that... To you, the listener, or the viewer... If you were untrained, you could still have a better match than whatever match we were watching. I think the vast majority of our audience could get drunk and do a better match than BT Washington and Tiger Conway. I think Dale Laparus was laughing at this match backstage. Oh, for sure. When it was happening. We had dudes going too fast. We had dudes falling all over each other. We had dudes landing on their heads. We had dudes tripping oh, God, and falling down. Fun. We I had did. dudes that were just completely lost. I couldn't even keep track of what was going on. In a on. 20 by 20 foot square, in, they were lost. In four minutes. In they fast. may as well have been in a maze. <laughs> yes, I, I didn't. I, I could not tear my eyes away from the screen to write down anything specific, but it's all coming back to me now. When Tiger Conway... How could you even write anything specific? I don't even know what was going on. Well, Guys you, just fell down right and left. <laughs> Tiger Conway did, in fact, almost kill... B.T. Washington with a body slam. <laughs> he just he lifted him up and just let go. <laughs> yes. There was the time when B.T. Washington was getting whipped from, you know, from rope to rope and just fell on his face 
I don't know what happened. It did seem like any time anyone touched BT Washington, he collapsed. You know, it was funny because the guy was being whipped in. And usually when you lose your balance, it's like you take a few steps, stumble, try to regain your balance, stumble a little more, fall down. No. The moment he was whipped in, he just fell flat on his face. It would be like if a guy was skiing down a hill and just like you, you pull a trip cord and he just his feet hit it and his face planted. It was amazing. So yeah, it went on for a while. I, it was at at no point was it not horrible. Like I say, one of the worst matches I've ever seen. One of the worst tag matches I've ever seen. And eventually they won with the double leg sweep the Jive Tone did, Jive Tones did. And then you noted all Tiger Conway Jr. had to do, he's on his back. The other guy's on his back. All he's got to do is roll over and make a cover. That was too complicated. That's right. He didn't even make it over. No. It's like it's like when Ryback hit the shell shock, but he's not facing the hard cam, so he's got to float over. Tiger Conway floated basically to half guard. He got halfway over, maybe. And that's when they just <laughs> stopped. Which, it. for those of you not familiar with jujitsu, was just one dude lying on another. Yeah, with he didn't even get his both legs over to the mount. No. There was, speaking of that, there was a Thai... Tui Vasa fight this weekend in UFC with Cyril Asker, which... Uh, Are just, you making these names up? No, okay. just went way too long. But anyway, Asker's just getting his... He's just getting pounded on. I he's getting his ass kicked. Well, he was. Ass curd. He, he, like, two minutes straight, he's just getting pounded on. And the ref won't stop it. And he's just standing there, and he's just, like, going like this for two minutes as he gets hit over and over again. And finally, he just fell down, and the ref stopped it. He just, like, all of a sudden just goes, bonk, and falls down. That's what happened when this guy was trying to be thrown from one side of the ring to the other. Yes. He just fell down. This was terrible. Unbelievably bad. I command all of you to go out of your way. It was this. actually unbelievably bad. I, I cannot believe how bad this was. You're yeah. hearing this and you're thinking we're exaggerating, but if you go back and watch El Negro and BT Washington versus the Jive Tones, you will not believe it. That is a guarantee. Tiger Conway and BT Washington are tied for this week's worst wrestler of all time of the week. Yes. A pox on you. They went to get a promo. Called out Ron Simmons. They dared him to find a partner. And this is just a bunch of guys who already had matches for Starcade. That was a good one. And it seems like they're done. They go both stop. And they look at the camera for a second. And they must have gotten the camera to keep going. Or the signal to keep going. Because they just kicked it back into gear. Claiming the best black tag team combination of all time. I'm quite certain that was not true even in 1988. Pretty sure they had to be the worst. They had to be. They had to have been the worst. I mean, they're the worst tag team I've ever seen, let alone the first black tag team. So, yeah. Eddie Gilbert versus George Fox, in case you were thinking we were done with the parade of horrible jobbers. George Fox wasn't that bad until Eddie Gilbert gave him three <laughs> something or others. Hit me. You know what it was? It was when David Flair hit Eric Bischoff. They were the weird half-fist, overhand, thumping things like this on the guy's head. I guess. I mean, that's what it was. All I know is, for those of you who have never seen the man, there was an Indian kickboxer named Raja Lion, who did, I believe, I hope, one pro wrestling match with Giant Baba in Japan, and in that one match established himself as one of the very worst wrestlers of all time. So, George Fox is standing in the corner as Eddie Gilbert comes out to what would later be Sting's guitar music. Maybe Sting stole the music when he beat Eddie in the match. And George is standing in the corner and I think, hey, it looks like a mini Raja Lion. And then the match begins and I realize he wrestles like a mini Raja Lion. Maybe he just kept growing and turned into Raja Lion. I don't know. It was awful. And he realized how bad this guy was and pinned him immediately with a hot shot. Well, I mean, he realized after he gave him the three moves... The three, and then he was like, this is over, Three dude. strikes? Yeah. It was three strikes, and, and you're up. Kind of looked like a skinny, young JBL, but he was very jiggly around the midsection, like a fat guy who'd lost a bunch of weight too fast. Okay. Very jiggly. I have nothing good to say about George Fox. Mm. Nikita Koloff cut a promo. It was funny, because Gilbert, Eddie Gilbert had just been in the ring, and of course, Eddie just runs away when Nikita's there to talk. So he uh, runs down Gilbert for running away. He plugs the bunkhouse stampede. He promises to defeat Terry Taylor at Starcade. He's got a bunkhouse stampede trucker hat. Yes. I'd love to know how many of those he sold. And he actually, this is, this is a direct quote, which should be in a book of timeless wisdom. If you can survive 18 to 20 men, it'll make your body tough. Hmm. 
Terry Taylor and Bob Emery. Terry Taylor and Bob Emery. So, Eddie Gilbert's on commentary. He is doing his own predictions. He does, in fact, he, he, he picks all the heels to win with two exceptions. First, Barry Windham and Steve Williams. There is no heel. So he predicts them to kill each other, so we'll never have to worry about either one ever again. And then he gets to Dusty and Lex, and he just says, I have no comment. Yeah. Okay. And then he says, he says Ric Flair is going to beat Ronnie Garvin, and he's going to take all of us out for free drinks, including you, Tony Schiavone, and I bet that prediction came true. He also he also plugged the video cassette tape that you can buy for sixty two ninety two or whatever. <laughs> And he said, I'm going to take out Missy Hyatt after Starcade. He did say that. <laughs> they were, in fact, together at the time. Yeah. So so Bob Emery is pretty horrible, but he was like Mike Jackson compared to some of the geeks we've seen on this show. He had show. a good physique. He actually looked like a wrestler. That helped. That helped. It was a boring squash. Taylor won with a figure four. Then you go to cut a, pro- cut a promo. And Taylor goes first. And I'm thinking, man, I've been hard on Taylor. This is one of his better promos. He thanked his parents for making... For creating such a great wrestler. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mom and Dad, for doing such a great job yeah. with me. Yes. And he said he'd be circling Nikita all night long. Nikita had talked about how hard it would be to fight, fight 20 guys in one night. Well, I'm going to be moving around you so fast, you'll think there's 25 guys in the ring. I'm going to wear you out. I'm going to snap your legs with the figure four. I'll be done with you once and for all. Snap him like a toothpick. That's right. I thought, hey, that wasn't a bad promo. And then Eddie Gilbert goes and just blows him out of the water. <laughs> Eddie Gilbert was, in fact, great. Terry Taylor? wasn't he's got this rep as being like a, a future star whose career was derailed by a horrible gimmick he was a guy whose career was ruined by a horrible gimmick yes so eddie's talking about facing nikita the night before starcade in new york and then tony gives one last big plug for the go home show and we, whatever happens we'll be back next week to talk about it and that was that and here's your card. Eddie Gilbert, Larry Zbysko, and Rick Steiner versus Jimmy Garvin, Michael Hayes, and the newcomer Sting. The newcomer Sting. Dr. Death, Steve Williams versus Barry Windham for the UWF heavyweight title. Mm-hmm. Rock and Rolls versus the Midnight in a Skywalkers match. Yes. Scaffold match. Nikita Koloff, Terry Taylor for the NWA and UWF World Television Champions Championships. First ever in wrestling, they said. That's right. Arn and Tully versus Road Warriors for the NWA World Tag Titles in the Road Warriors' hometown. That's right, too. Dusty Rhodes Lex Luger in a cage match for the NWA U.S. title. With Dusty's career at stake. That's right, 90, 90 days. days. Yes. His 90-day career. Hmm. And Rick, because, you know, 90 days, everybody will forget about Dusty. Dusty who? He will no longer be able to have a career. Dusty. Hmm. And Ric Flair, Ron Garvin, steel cage match for the NWA World Heavyweight title, which I guess... This is and there will be gorilla shit all over the army. The show was new, and they got rid of Ron Garvin as the champion. I think that's the biggest <laughs> issue here that we've that we're facing. That helped a lot. Yeah. Well, let's get going. Well, on that note, the first thing they showed was just Ric Flair going to the ring with his music playing. That's it. Nothing else needed to be said. I thought they were going to show us that Ric Flair video for the nine thousandth time. Nope. That we've seen eighty. Like twice per show for a year. Yes. No. Nope. I'm over it. This was just his entrance from Starcade. He came out playing the 2001 song, wearing his robe. He was the greatest wrestler ever. It was very clear. And if you missed Starcade and you tuned tuned into this show to see what happened at Starcade, this entrance alone should have made it very clear. Ric Flair won. They go to the announcer, singular Tony Schiavone, working solo this week. And he opens with the big news. Nelson Royal is the new junior heavyweight champion. That is literally what he started with. Yes. <laughs> I could not it. even believe my eyes. What's happening over there? Tony's dropping. Sounds everything. like there's an earthquake going on. He heard so. Nelson Royal won the title and he just. <laughs> he the world stopped. Beset with a fit of apoplexy. That's what happened. Uh, so then he did get into uh, all the other title changes at Starcade and. Upstep Nikita Koloff with two TV belts. He said Terry Taylor was his, one of his best opponents up there, uh, best opponents ever, right up there with Lex Luger and Magnum TA. But now it's time to move on to the bunkhouse stampede. He will have to prepare to fight 20, maybe 25 men in a night. And then he left to go prepare. You know, what the fuck's going on with his stampede here? Like, no one knows how many guys are in it. 
Jim Cornette later does an interview. He has no idea how much money's on the line. Right. Like, nobody knows anything about well, the Stampede. Part of it is because the, the, the Stampede gimmick was there would be a battle royal at the end of every show. And then I the see. Winners of all the battle royals who go to the finals. I see. I see. So some nights there might be twenty. I forgot about that. Some yep. nights there might be twenty-five. I did think it was funny that as the show went on, they always added more people to the match. It never went down. Yeah, nobody knows what's going on. Yeah, it's like they're booking on the fly. It is. I'm sure they got some sort of plan, but when you watched it, it sounded like they didn't have a plan. Mm-hmm. That's all I got out of this. The Rock and Roll Express versus Trent Knight and Larry Stevens. We had new generic music for the rock and rolls, and I think it may actually have been the music they were using at the time. Hmm. I think they got their own generic music here. Had a revelation during this match. So, if you remember, if you watch any of these Rock and Roll Express matches, they always give their opponent something. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Road Warriors don't. No. Road Warriors go in there, they smash guys. A lot of guys would go in there, and they would just smash guys. I was watching this match, and I finally figured it out. It sounds ridiculous, but this is what it was. They would give the jobbers a spot so that they could then do a great tag team, double team spot. Yes. They were learning to be a great team while doing these squash matches. Sure. Do you remember when Dave Batista was the Leviathan in Ohio Valley? I do, I do. He's a big, jacked up, freaky guy going in there just smashing dudes, working like a big guy. Mm -hmm. Gets called up to the main roster. He's he's just he's he couldn't figure it out. He was one of the only guys that did not have good things to say about working for Ohio Valley Wrestling. That's right. He felt they didn't train him mm-hmm. to be a guy who goes back and forth. Yeah. Because when all you do is squash matches, it's hard to learn how to be a worker. Sure. So anyway, I thought it was cool. Rock and rolls go in there. They give the jobber just enough to let them do a double team, and then they cut him off. Yeah. Unlike the Road Warriors, who just beat the hell out of guys, and then when it was time to do a singles match, when it was time to go back and forth, it wasn't always the greatest thing in the world. The other thing they did, this went longer than it needed to for an opening squash match in a two-hour show, but uh, the Rock and Rolls, they would do head locks or chin locks or arm bars, but they wouldn't just lie there. They'd crank the hold on, they'd lean left, they'd lean right, and if they went like 20 seconds and nothing else to do, Screw it. We're just going to let go of this hold and do something else. They were not just, you know, time never froze in this match. There was always something going on. So it was fine. It went longer than it needed to. And they won with a double drop kick. So their match ends. The bell rings. And if you've never watched the show, the interview podium is just about 20 feet from the ring, maybe. And as soon as the bell rings, here's Jim Cornette, the Midnight Express, and Big Bubba to cut their promo. And Cornette starts by running down Morton's family. Your dad's an alcoholic. Your mom's ugly. But the Rock and Rolls have nothing to win. They're, they're outnumbered. They just walk to the back. So Cornette moves on. Says Bubba, of course, in the uh, the Muckhouse Stampede last year, he won more money than anybody else. He didn't win the most matches, but he won the most money. And money was more important. He said, "I still haven't figured this out yet." I, I, How do you win the most money but not the most matches? Like some are more valuable than others. Apparently. Uh, the, it was almost when Cornet was talking about it, it was almost like everybody chips in money. And maybe it's a percentage of the house. Well, I'm saying like every it's like everybody puts in a hundred bucks mm-hmm. or you know, it's wrestling, a thousand dollars. Everybody chips in a thousand, the winner gets the pot. Yeah. So if you have a thirty man, mm-hmm. it's more valuable than a twenty man. Sure. So that could be a way to win the most money but not win the most matches. Yeah. Where is David Crockett to explain this to me? Where has this guy been? We are left to draw our own conclusions and make our own guesses. Maybe it's based on the house. Maybe it's best on, based on the numbers. Maybe it's, maybe it's based on time. The faster you're in the battle royale, the more money you get. I don't know the answer. Mm-hmm. So Dusty Rose is the new U.S. champion. As far as Cornette's concerned, Stan and Bobby, the U.S. tag team champions, a much better representation of America. Maybe one of them is going to take that U.S. belt from Dusty. The best part of this is... It's Cornette ranting and being a lunatic. It's Big Bubba being the statue behind him. And here's Stan and Bobby, as relaxed as can be. Stan's like leaning on the podium with his arms crossed. And Bobby's just standing there, probably waiting to get back to chew chew some more tobacco. And they're just fucking with each other silently the entire time. What the hell else did they need to do? They had nothing else to do. That's what we got Cornette for. That's why everybody needs a manager. Yes. But it made them seem cool because they were totally at ease. Michael P.S. Hayes and Gorgeous Jimmy. 
That's how the graphics read. Do you know how many times on this show I have said, you know, why aren't the gladiators teaming up? Yes. Why aren't the thunder foots or feet or whatever teaming up? Yes. Well, fuck it on this show. We had it happen twice. We had both gladiators in a tag match here. No, 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 no. I mean, you're right, but for some reason, they're not the gladiators. They're Gladiator 1 yes. and Gladiator 2. <laughs> that is true. We've never seen a Gladiator 3. No. I mean, there's no proof there's more than two Gladiators, mm. but they were very specific. It's Gladiator 1, Gladiator 2, and Thunderfoot 1 and Thunderfoot 2. That's true. That one I can see, because what are... Are they Thunderfoots? Are thunder they Thunderfeet? Yes. What the hell are they? So it's easier in that to say Thunderfoot 1 and 2, but this could have been the Gladiators. They didn't want to do that. It's Gladiator number one. Gladiator one, Gladiator two. And again, I hadn't thought that much, but yes, they are teasing perhaps the arrival of further Gladiators. Could be. There could be a hundred Gladiators. So the Freebirds, as uh, they were pushing this actually before Starcade, but even harder now, they are the new top contenders to Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson for the World Tag Titles. And they beat up these two Gladiators, and Jimmy won with a Brain Buster. Damn, top contenders for the World Tag Team Titles. Can you even imagine? Sure. I, I guess. <laughs> Somebody has to be. Uh, you know, I just think of all the great tag teams, and I mean, they're not bad. But I would never say that one of the great tag teams of all time. I mean, one of the great acts is the Freebirds. Mm -hmm. But can you really say one of the great tag teams of all time is Michael Hayes and gorgeous Jimmy Garvin? What you can say is that of the babyface teams on this roster at this time, they had gone the longest since their last loss. I guess so. I'm pretty sure you, I believe you can factually say that. And you know, I never thought about it, but that scaffold match was not for the titles. No, it was a non-title scaffold match. <laughs> yes, they risked... They, they, it was a non-title match where well, you win by throwing your goddamn opponents off a 20-foot scaffold. You risked your life Maybe careers, killing them. Yes. I would think the title should be on the line. Well, I would counter that the uh, championships should go to the best wrestling team. Uh, no, 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 Vinny. Let's say you and I have a scaffold match, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm the white... Actually, you're the YWF champion. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why would we have a non-title scaffold match? Because if I throw your ass as champion mm -hmm. off that scaffold and you fall 20 feet, your career's over, buddy. Oh, there's that. You'll never be able to defend the title. Right? Uh, they did. They were, they lost the match, the match and came back and wrestled here. Well, they're not you. They are not. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying clear. that someone could be seriously injured in a match like that. I feel that a championship should be on the line. That's, That's my true. thought. So they show the finish. Of the Alex Luger Dusty Rhodes match from Starcade, like the last five minutes, Dusty won. As we recapped, they go back to the studio and Tony. Gives Hold on, I got to talk a little bit about this match a second time. Can you believe how much they showed of this fucking it horrific was kind match? Of amazing, dude! Like they, they showed five minutes. Okay, mm -hmm. one minute was exciting. The end. There were four <laughs> minutes of fucking nothing happening. Now, with that said. The five-minute version was better than the 16-minute version. Sure. I will give them that. I'll also say, and this is kind of proving your point, I realize technology was different in 1987 than it is in 2018, but they had 48 hours to make a highlight package out of that match. No. But they just showed the last five minutes. Just showed the Start last. Start at point A. And Dusty's DDT was not nearly as impressive the second time around. I thought it was cool the first time. Then they showed a replay, and I was like, you didn't even leave your feet. You just fell down. You pretended to jump and didn't. You're like the Mighty Wilbur. We'll get to him. So Dusty wins, and they go back to Tony in the studio. He says, folks, I've been around this sport for four years. <laughs> I've been around. It's been a rough four years covering this business. Four years? Yeah. And he says... I've seen these men in, in the ring, out of the ring. What you're about to see is a side of the dream that not many, not many people have seen before, but I have. And they go to a press conference. Did you get that, Tony? A press conference? Okay. Uh, he so, wanted to make sure you got I, I that finger part quotes. of the... You know yeah. what it was? It was a Bellator, or Strike Force. Does Strike Force not have press? Well, the there press was conference? a show I went to in Everett. I've told this story before. I think it was Strike Force. I'm pretty sure it was, but... After the show was over, like, it was me and one other guy in the press area. That's more than they had here. And I went up That's to him. That's two more guys than they had here. And I said, what time does the post-fight press conference start? And the the lady in charge actually goes, what's that? Mm. They didn't have one. <laughs> so the press area here actually was bigger. They actually had a room. They had a room. They had no press. Yeah. So what we saw was there's a table, 
And uh, there's a space in the middle of the table sitting at either end. One end is Jim Crockett. The other end, I recognized him, but I didn't know his name. He was like the, the board of directors or something. Sandy Scott, maybe? Yeah, that's probably sure was. I didn't even pay attention. There's two guys behind him. One of them was, was Johnny gasp. Weaver. I didn't know the other guy. In walks Dusty, and there's some random guy holding up the U.S. title. His second. Yeah. I don't know who it was. No. His, <laughs> his lackey. Yeah. So Dusty is all street clothes, showered, cleaned up. Now, he did have a baseball cap and sunglasses on, so he couldn't tell if he was bandaged or not. But they claimed this is a press conference the same night as Starcade, just a few hours maybe after he won the U.S. title. It looked days later. He said, Dusty it did a brief statement, took no questions from the press that was not there. He said uh, he had, he was as tired as he did. First of all, actually, he talked about winning the match and said, someday the lessons I have taught Lex Luger will make him unbeatable. He took credit for everything Lex ever did after that point. But yeah. Then he says, I'm as tired as I've ever been. It might be time to lay this old body down. I'm going to go home and think about this. And I have to, If I have to retire in 1988, I'll be grateful for my entire career. And he gets up, and he walks away, and that's that. You know what? I mean, it was kind of neat that he said, like, Lex is the best. He is the best athlete in this country. Mm-hmm. He learned lessons in that match with me that he will carry... With him for the rest of his career, he may never lose again. So, in putting the guy over, he did also put himself up. Put himself up. It actually should be studied. What do you think about? Yes, it? Exactly. Know, how, how to how to how to uh, piggyback off someone else's uh, push. I mean, he did win. And he did win. Yeah. Larry Zabisco versus Bob Riddle. Okay. This 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 here is historic. So, I can't, in all honesty, say they did nothing for five minutes. Not literally nothing. There was like one lockup and maybe one push. In pro wrestling terms, they did nothing yes. for five minutes. Now, the heat was great. Yeah, they, for like 30 seconds. Well, they, they, the other fans were into this. They were they were chanting things that Larry, he would shout back at them. They would call him a wimp or a chicken. And they talk about how they, they wanted Barry instead of Larry. And I was losing my mind. It was just going forever. And then they started to wrestle. I had a whole new appreciation for Larry Zabisco and his ability to fill TV time with absolutely nothing to work with. Yeah. Bob Riddle, the worst wrestler of all time of the week, and it wasn't close. He fucked up every single thing they did, including the neck breaker at least twice, which is Larry's finish. So he tried it. He got fucked up. He tried it. He got fucked up. He tried it at least a third time, hit it, won, and moved on with his life. Hopefully, hopefully to never wrestle Bob Riddle again. So to recap, mm-hmm. they did nothing for five minutes. Yes. They had a very brief heat, and then Larry had to do his finish at least two times. Mm-hmm. I saw it two times. Could have been three. And then got the win. Yeah. This was horrible, Vinny. <laughs> was... I want no defense of it. Oh, what made you think I was defending it? I don't know. You said the, the heat was awesome. I mean, well, there was nothing the, awesome about this match. The crowd was cheering loudly. Sure. It does not mean the same thing as anything about this was awesome. Yes, nothing. So then Larry goes to go to promo. He says, Barry Windham's time is up. He's going to take the Western States Heritage title. Yeah. He also starts to challenge Ric Flair. <laughs> this, this, was actually, this was awesome, legitimately awesome. He begins to challenge Ric Flair, but Baby Doll interrupts him. He says, what about Dusty Rhodes? He's the U.S. champion, and I know everything about him how to beat him. Because you see, Larry is Baby Doll's pawn. Baby Doll has brought Larry in to get revenge on Dusty Rhodes. Yes. And she does not want him bothering with Ric Flair. He is there to challenge Dusty Rhodes. Even Wyndham, even the Western States thing, even that she just wants him to use as a stepping stone to get to Dusty. I love when she said that Dusty wasn't, I quote, easy meat. (laughs) Well, I didn't catch that until right now. Oh, I did. But... You caught the important stuff. I caught easy oh, I, meat. I disagree. I think you caught the, the, the most hey, speaking of meat, entertaining part. Hmm? It's actually cheese. So we had the moment on Thursday's show. We did. Okay. I've got to, I've got to clarify this, Vinny. You don't understand. Okay? Okay. So I want to make this short and sweet. Yeah. I didn't think that his name was the Velveeta Dream. Okay. I knew it was the Velveteen Dream. Sure. My confusion was I thought the cheese was called Velveteen. Okay. I've got to make that clear. I did not spend six months going, 
Why is he the Velveeta Dream? No, no. I I'm, knew he was Velveteen. I knew you had his name right. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make that clear. But, and by the way, on the board, do not send cheese to my post office box. Don't do it. <laughs> and there's already a thread. Actually, it was Craig on Twitter was setting up my post office box. Was he really? Do not. It is, you know why? It's because Craig wants a cheese. Because he knows I ain't going to eat the cheese. So if he gets a bunch of cheese sent to my post office box, he knows he's taking cheese home. Mm -hmm. Okay, don't do this, everybody. For the record, I don't think that thinking Velveteen is cheese is any better than thinking his name was the Velveteen. Well, you should, Vinny. You've made mistakes like this before, I'm sure. Oh, I've been putting not involving in food, I'm sure, but maybe Very rarely exercise. I don't know. <laughs> so maybe you heard some exercise and you thought it was called something, but it was something else, you know. Because you don't go to the gym. I see what Got it? Okay. I see where you're getting at. All right, Thank let's you, yes. get moving here. So they show a clip of Zabisco wrestling Barry Windham, and Baby Doll passes Larry a foreign object. He <laughs> clunks Barry in the jaw with it. He just smashed him with whatever this, this gimmick was. It was one of those old gimmicks. It was probably like, you know, something really soft wrapped up in that. Probably, tape. yeah. yeah. So if he makes a cover. The ref counts three. Larry wins, but outruns Tim Horner. To stooge Zabisco off. He says, no, no, this man used a foreign object. He reached his hand into Larry Zabisco's trunks to pull out the gimmick. Well, what, he, are you, what are you going to do? You got to. I guess you got to. Yeah. It's one, the, it's one of the rough things about this business. I suppose so. He's not going to reach into his own tights. If you want something out of Larry Zabisco's trunks, you got to reach your hand in there yourself. Okay. So the ref sees the gimmick. He disqualifies Zabisco. The match is over. Larry's response is to beat the holy fuck out of Tim Horner and then stop and beat up Barry Windham some more, too. Larry Zabisco had a long, long, long career. He did a lot of really great stuff. He was a world champion in the AWA, main eventer, what, what, probably uh, Bruno Sammartino's biggest enemy. Terrible commentator. He was a terrible he did it commentator all. for a long time. I don't think he was ever put over as a monster any more than he was here. Well, He's hey. the destroyer of worlds. Guy reaching to his tights. I'd, well, that's true. That's a good. That's a reaching to a man's trunks is a good way to get him to beat your ass. Yeah, yeah. And they go back to the studio when Larry rants about how all, how all the champions are in danger now. And ironically, after talking about reaching new guys' tights, who comes out next? Ric Flair. Ric Flair. Yes. Gets a standing ovation from this crowd. <laughs> it was so amazing. They're on their feet. They were Yay! so grateful. <laughs> like as much as they, as much as they pretend to hate Flair, as much as they pretend to like Garvin. The world champion was champion of the world again. It was cause for celebration. Well, you know, it was. It was. They show the finish of the Flair Garvin match, which Flair, of course, is more than happy to watch. And then Flair goes off. He says, That's right. For the fifth time, I walked that aisle and I came back as world champion. And now I promise to be more obnoxious, more overbearing. And I'll teach everyone to learn to love it. Says he just he destroyed Ronnie Garvin. Tully and Arn destroyed the Road Warriors. Lex Luger suffered a minor setback. Nothing he can't fix tomorrow. Talked about how great all the horsemen were. Said he's the captain of the team, and Lex, the captain, still got your back. And he added, he would not be surprised if Dusty retired, because nobody would want to wrestle. Uh, nobody would want, would want to wrestle Luger twice. You know, this is an astounding fact. Later, Ron Garvin talks about how he'd been champion for, it was like two months or something like that. Mm -hmm. The ratings for this fucking show, when Ronnie Garvin won the title, they were slashed by 40%. <laughs> it's amazing. Okay. Let me explain how amazing that is. Raw is doing about 3.2 million viewers on a good week. This would be like over the course of two months. They fell from 3.2 million viewers to 1.92 million. Yeah. <laughs> that would be bad. So when Flair came out here and he vowed to be more obnoxious than ever, <laughs> and he vowed to be more overbearing, make us all learn to love it, I was like, he's telling you to tell your friends to watch this fucking show again. Yeah. Because the horsemen are back. Yes. Ron Garvin is no more. Luger's minor setback. To be continued. Oh, oh yeah. It'll be continued, all right. Sting versus David Isley. Is Sting regressed? I was going to say... Was, what the fuck? In all seriousness, was this the worst performance you've ever seen Sting do in a match? Funny you should mention that. 
I just today rewatched Sting versus Jeff Hardy when Jeff was inebriated. Yes. Okay. I never watched that match a second time. Mm-hmm. I like I would get the TNA pay per view and it was gone. Sure. Like I'm done with this show. Mm-hmm. I watched this again. Jeff Hardy, like at the time, I didn't realize how fucked up the guy was. Okay. Cause it's Jeff Hardy. Yeah. He's always a little weird. Sure. Okay. He was clearly not in, like, a great state of mind, but, I mean, he stumbled a little bit coming out. He got on the middle rope and did his deal. Like, he danced around, he threw his shirt out and everything like that. I mean, he was... I've seen a lot worse. Okay. Let's just put it that way. I may have been in the ring with worse. Sure. But, man, you look at Sting, this fucking guy's so mad. Oh, yeah. The look on his face, he is furious, okay? Okay. What I don't remember is, the match isn't really even that bad. I mean, they lock up, it goes fine, Sting kicks him and kind of bulls him into the corner, and Jeff does everything like he would normally do. He's, I don't even know how to explain it except to say that, for those of you that think this is the most like appalling performance in a guy's, that they've ever seen, like, like watch Hardy. more wrestling. Yeah. This ain't even close. Yeah. Like some of the Kerry Von Erich matches we've seen yes. from, they're yes. way worse than Jeff was. Yep. But fucking... Sting grabs a guy, hits the reverse DDT. What I don't remember is that Jeff tried to kick out. Oh, yeah. And Sting just shot, held him down. Yes. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Sting. He holds an amateur win over Jeff Hardy. He does. The that only was amateur, crazy. The only amateur wrestling match he ever had. Yeah. It was the, uh, the, the, the shoot. And man. And that was his shoot. Sting fucking shoots on this guy basically to win the match. And then he just gets up and stands there. And Jeff's all mad. And Sting doesn't like leave the ring because maybe there's going to be a problem. Oh, no. He just stays in the ring like, dude, if there's a problem, I will fucking punch you, dude. Yes. I'm not a shooter, but you know what? You're not a shooter and you're fucked up. Exactly. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's complete bullshit. It's like a terrible moment the, in TNA history. The, but... I think about that. Yeah, it was there amazing. There was a point as Sting is going up the ramp and his music playing. And you hear a fan shout, that was bullshit. And Sting turns and says, I agree. Yeah. Now. And man, you see Borash doing the ring intros, and boy, is he just morose. He had to know. Oh, everyone knew. He's like, his head's hanging down, and he's like, the following contest is scheduled for one fall. He knows that whatever is going to happen is not going to be good. They send out Eric Bischoff just to get punched. Like, hey, this will make everything better. Wrong. That was amazing. But anyway, that was better than this match. Yes. It could have been David Isley. No. I mean, I'm sure no, some actually, of it was. I mean, he didn't help, but... No. No, Sting was horribly sloppy here. Yeah. He had no idea what he was doing. He didn't seem to care. There was a point where he just decided, I'm going to drop a bunch of elbows. doesn't matter where Isley is or what he's doing, I'm going to drop an elbow on him. So if I have these face up, I'll drop an elbow. Face down, drop an elbow. Sitting up, I'll drop an elbow. Rolling over to the side, I'll drop an elbow. Getting to his feet, I'll drop an elbow. Goes on for a while. And then the worst part was actually, he he goes to throw him into the ropes and give him the standing back elbow. This is, I mean, forget first day of wrestling school Anybody stuff. could do this. This is kids playing on the playground a stuff. A corpse could do this. Yes. A mannequin. Staying throws this back elbow and then... If you're David Isley and you get hit with this elbow and you want to fall down, there was nowhere for you to fall where Sting wasn't. Yeah, he was all over. He <laughs> occupied the entire ring somehow on this very simple, very basic back elbow. He was horrible here. Eventually, he won with the Stinger Splash and the Scorpion. I reiterate, the worst Sting performance I've ever seen. And by the way, he didn't really do that much, but when he goes to do his promo, he oh, is gasping for breath. And there was a break. Yeah. And he had two minutes or so, or maybe three, to catch his breath. Now, I won't lie, I did love the promo. Well, yeah, because he's out of his mind. He's so out of his mind. Like, I don't know. They didn't have Red Bull back then, (laughs) but I mean, there was a lot of caffeine this guy had in him. Sure. He's out of control, randomly shrieks. Very randomly. He just shrieks and he goes, you know, Tony, I need to do that at least once a night. It's a great tension reliever. Great tension reliever, yes. What? And whenever he loses his train of thought, he just turns his back to the camera. He starts screaming. Screams some more. Turns around and picks up wherever he left off. Hounding his chest like he's King Kong. Does a lot. And he's somewhere in the middle of all this. Tony's got a, a point he's supposed to drag out of this man. And uh, and he, he starts, tries to ask about the bunkhouse stampede. But Sting won't stop screaming. Yeah. So Sting has to ask, what was that? Yeah. 
And Shivani says something at the bunkhouse stampede, and Sting says, oh, that's right up my alley. That's another great tension release. And he beats his chest, and he howls, and he goes off. Sting was awesome. He was. He was He was a god to these people. Yes. And then we go from that to Jim Crockett. This is like the biggest <laughs> contrast there's ever been in the history of wrestling. Like, Crockett is one of those mannequins I was just talking about yes. that could have a better match with Sting. He's so low key and quiet and morose. His, his his volume is a two. His monotone is a fifty. He speaks like this. He talks about Dusty Rhodes. I was very surprised he talked about retiring. I was stunned. I almost fell out of my chair. He did. I didn't believe him. I'm sorry. I used so much life. Would you <laughs> like me to try again? You may do your best. I almost fell out of my chair. Nope. You still I can't do it. You cannot. You, you, you cannot, I need a dead body. Yeah. Or a speaking spell or something. I've had long talks with him. That was closer. Midnight Express versus Thunderfoot number one and Thunderfoot number two. Oh, he did say two. Friday uh, afternoon, Dusty went to the Bunkhouse Stampede press conference, so he did return to do something. He will be defending his title at the Stampede, but that's all I can tell you. <laughs> that's all I know. We'll find out more later. Yes. Midnight Express versus the Thunderfoots. Cornette does this promo. We are so desperate for competition, he says. We weren't getting any competition from the other side. We had to go into our own locker room and take the Thunderfoots, former Central States Tag Team Champions. Wow. Were they really? That's what he said. Oh, my God. Hold on. A <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know what other tag teams. The Kansas Jayhawks? So, uh, yeah. Had, basically saying we had to go into the heel locker room to get a match here. And then they just beat him bell to bell in one with a flapjack. So some competition. You know, Vinny, remember when we used to watch Finding Bigfoot? Well, you did. You did. I think you watched one show. Watched one or two, yeah. But one of the big things on that show is they always refer to them as Bigfoots. Sure. And you think it should be Big Feet, right? Okay. Doesn't that, right? Foot, feet, Bigfoots? Yeah. Yeah. Well, interestingly enough, the Thunder Foots, that's how they were billed. Billed as a team. Thunder <laughs> Foots, not the Thunder Feet. Okay. So, just wanted to mention that. Let's see what it says here. David Isley. Oh, man, it's revealed their identities. I apologize. I'll stop right there. Let's see. Does that see. mean he did double duty on the show? Uh, Maybe. I guess so. Maybe. I don't see a title history here. How about looking at the history of the Central States Tag Team titles? Actually, every result here is from the 2000s. Really? Can you imagine? Joel Deaton. Let's see here. Yeah, look at that. Central States. NWA Central States Tag Team title. The Thunderfoots won that together as a team. As Dave Deaton, he won other titles as well. The Midnight Rockers held this title in 1985. Really? Yeah. Traded with the Batten Twins. Moondog Moretti, former champion. Central States? Yeah. Wow. Team with, team with Bobby Jaggers. Holy smokes. Guy's a legend. The Mod Squad, Pork Chop Cash, the final champions in 1988, Rick Patterson and Stevie Ray. Not that Stevie Ray. I'm certain not that Stevie Ray. Probably a couple of Stevie Rays, it's not. Anyway, yeah. let's talk about Lex Luger here. So J.J. Dillon and Lex Luger come out for a promo. I got to talk about this Luger guy. This Lex Luger here was fucking... Well, first off, his, his sweater sucked. That's beside the point. <laughs> well, that's why I took it off. He comes out here, and he cuts his promo, and he congratulates Dusty, talks about all of the titles the horseman left with, except for himself, he said. He says, I had control of that match. Everybody knows that there are wrestlers and there are superstars in this sport. And he says, Dusty, you are a superstar. Ric Flair is a superstar, and so am I. It's a very important line, by the way. Tears off his sweater, screams about how he learned something every time he wrestles. He will rise to a level that nobody has ever seen. This fucking promo was great. Oh, yes. What happened to Lex Luger? <laughs> Don't know. I watch these shows and I'm like, how is this guy not a Hall of Famer? He, he was great. And, and you know what? We watched the 90s and he was so fucking over. Mm -hmm. Like those early Nitro shows. Oh, yeah. It's crazy. What went wrong? He huh. was over in that War Games we just watched. Mm -hmm. Remember the night he beat Hogan for the title on Night Oh, my God. It was insane. Yes. And yes, this was a amazingly great promo. And it had to be because this was 48 hours after losing his first title. Yeah. He had to 
redeem himself. He had to uh, reestablish himself. He had to recover. He did great. He was as big a star as he was here, maybe bigger than he had been when he won the title. So great, great work on his part. I also like when he he takes off a shirt and flexes and says, "It's time to show off the merchandise." Yeah, it's always a great line. Steve Williams versus Tommy Angel. May I? Sure. Far be it from me to criticize Dr. Death, Steve Williams. But he went for way too many covers. He's in there with Tommy Angel. Mm -hmm. He covered Tommy Angel like three times, and Tommy Angel kicked out. Sure. And I was like, do you realize you're weakening your own character and your own performance and your moves and everything? Why is Tommy Angel kicking out of anything Dr. Death does? He should have walked in there and smashed this guy and then beat him. Instead, he's like, he rolls him up. I like Tommy Angel kicks out. Yeah. He goes in there, and Dr. Death's whole thing is he does terrifying power spots, and he does football stuff, because that was his gimmick. That right about covers it. Then he gets in here, and he begins doing arm drags and drop kicks like a luchador. And they look good. He's grabbing this guy and throwing, throwing him around by the arm. But it was, it was strange to watch Dr. Death wrestle like this. And eventually, he hit a press slam, a football tackle, which Tommy Angel somehow managed to fuck that up. Then he hit the stampede and won. And he goes to get a promo. And in Steve Williams' mind, there is no controversy in his title match with Barry Windham. He had done what any athlete would do with gold on the line. Talked about football teams doing whatever it took to win. He did whatever it took to win. Offered Wyndham a rematch whenever he wanted. And then he moved on to the bunkhouse stampede. So there might be 30 or 35 men in one ring. And it won't matter. I'll come out No one top. knows. No one knows. <laughs> it's a great mystery. What's going on here? He said, in his words, he was the fossil of the UWF. Yeah. It's dead. He's a museum piece now. Yeah. But he's a champion. But he was still a UWF champion. And he could still prove how tough he was. Yeah. Ronnie Garvin came out for a promo. Oh, man. Uh, you want to have this one? I will. I'll just do the beginning. This had to be a rib. Ron Garvin stands in front of us. His first interview since losing the NWA World Heavyweight title to Ric Flair. Clean in the middle of the ring. These are his exact words to begin this promo. He says, well, you know, Tony, I can tell you. I had a bad ankle, bad ribs. I had a fever. I had the flu. But I ain't going to make no excuse because I was perfectly healthy. I felt good. <laughs> That's what he said. What? <laughs> I mean, first off, first off, he's talking about how he doesn't want to make any excuses. But he begins with a litany of excuses. Four excuses. A bad ankle, bad ribs, a fever, and the flu. Then he says, I'm not going to make any excuses. And then on top of that, he says, I was perfectly healthy. I think... He's a baby face. Okay. <laughs> What's okay. happening? I, 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 I understand why you are confused. He did a poor job of delivering his message. You I, sound like you're going to defend this. I'm, I'm going to explain what I think he was trying to get at. Okay. I think he was trying to take a shot at other people who blamed their losses on bad ankles and bad ribs and the fevers and the flu. He said, I could say all these things, but I'm not going to. Uh, huh. Well, he didn't say that, Vinny. But oh. thanks. I did my best for trying to save. Did we mention horrific. his outfit? Oh, I'm I'm still I'm still hung up on Luger's sweater. So oh, Luger's sweater was nothing. And then Sullivan's shirt later. <laughs> so Ronnie Garvin just lost the world title 48 hours ago. Comes out here and he and the whole gimmick was he was every man. But he before he was every man who like would at least do laundry. He's out here in this trucker cap. It's got the U.S. flag and the Confederate flag. Ah. Uh. It says, American by birth, Southern by the grace of God. He's from Canada. He's also got the big, thick denim vest over his polo. This, is, this did not look like it. You didn't like it? No. Nah, it sucked. So, he says when a football team loses the Super Bowl, they can fire the coaches and all the players. But he's got no coach, and he's the only player. So, I'll just have to run twice as far, and swim twice as far, and train twice as long. At this point, the Freebirds came out to save the day. So he doesn't understand the concept of overtraining. I guess not. Mm. He's, he's fucked now. The Freebirds come out to save the day. This promo was going off a cliff. So Michael Hayes says, listen, I've seen all the big matches, all the big fights. 
I've never had the feeling I had watching that Flair Garvin match like I like I did that. Oh night. yeah. Well, I'm skeptical. It says in his eyes, Ronnie is still the champion. No. He thanked Ronnie, in fact, for ex- exposing all of Ric Flair's weaknesses and vulnerabilities. A sunset flip off the top. <laughs> That's the only one I can come up and with. Chopping. Yeah. And so. They all want a shot at Flair. Jimmy congratulates his brother. You proved Flair can be beaten. You proved nothing's impossible. So Hayes wants a shot at Flair. Jimmy Garvin wants a shot at Flair. Ronnie Garvin, who just lost his championship and has not yet gotten a rematch, says, Hey, any one of us might do it. Who knows? Good luck, Flair. I just love he when... He didn't give a shit. <laughs> I just love when <laughs> Hayes is going on and on about how I want a shot at this title. And Garvin's just kind of... He's just sitting there with his head down. <laughs> Do who he was. This just hit me. And I, I think it's actually before that. Ronnie Garvin was Buster Douglas. He had his late career Miracle World Championship win. It didn't last long. He lost right away again and faded away. And he was done. Yeah. That was this. So we watch these shows. Weeks go by with nothing but squashes. And then we may get one... Ric Flair match. Or, like when Ric Flair randomly said, I'm going to have a great match with Mike Jackson. And he did. So the, the screen comes up. Ron Simmons versus Rick Steiner. Holy smokes. Well, then. Well, you know, they didn't have a finish, so they could just have the match. They did not. They didn't have they to beat either guy. So they start, and it was funny listening to Shivani call them youngsters over and over again. I'm pretty sure Ron was in his 30s here, I think. Or close. I don't know if he was that old. Yeah. So it's two Big, scary-looking mofos. And that is not doing justice to the size of these men. Okay. They were enormous. They were monsters. Rick's, I cannot believe the size of Rick Steiner. He's like... He is... He's not quite as big as Scott Steiner in the 1999 mm-hmm. Nitros were watching, but fuck, he's close. He's close. And, and this was a decade earlier. And he's way more mobile. Yes. <laughs> If, if, if that that Steiner in the nineties, the Scott Steiner in ninety nine is very very scary. But if you're ten feet away, you're safe. If you're ten feet away from this Rick Steiner, he'll run you down and tear your head off. Simmons was twenty nine, well, almost in his thirties, and he had debuted in eighty six. So I, they were youngsters in this business. I many. suppose so. Yeah. So they're doing very basic stuff. It's mostly headlocks and the occasional tackle. And then Kevin Sullivan comes out in this fucking shirt. A very, very red shirt. It is so red. He looks like the Kool-Aid man. I suppose so. That's how red it was. What was he wearing? Why? And then no pants on. (laughs) The always creepy t-shirt over resting trunks, or or shirt over resting trunks, so it looks like you're nude. Yes. So, Sullivan begins to shout at Rick, distracting him. He's giving him instructions. Which I should have written down. Did you write any of these down? I didn't write any of them down. They were just... It was not quite Mark Curry yelling, smash him. But it was close to just as, as useless as those instructions could be. So Rick finally hits a power slam. But instead of making a cover, he stops to stare at Sullivan and ask what he's shouting about. So Simmons pops up, hits a schoolboy for a two count. Steiner pops up out of that, just clobbers uh, Simmons right in the balls. Just nut shots him. Ref don't care. Ref's Teddy Long, by the way. Mm-hmm. So hadn't put two and two together. I guess not. So uh, Rick's yelling at Sullivan Moore. He throws Simmons over the top rope. Also not a DQ when it should be. And then Steiner and Sullivan just leave. And Simmons gets back in. I think I think I assume Sullivan and Steiner countered out. I'm not sure. The bell did ring, and then and, and uh, Simmons' hand was raised. So he must have. I guess it could have been a DQ for one of those violations. We've talked way too much about this man. All I know is this could have been way 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 better. But it leads to the creation of the Varsity Club. Yes. So that is awesome. That is coming. You know, speaking of referees, so this Roman Reigns deal with this uh, Richard Rodriguez who is in prison and is promising all these videos. Mm. The filmmaker that he's working with is named Johnny Bravo. Really? Yeah. Johnny Bravo. Mm. So I watched TNA for the first time on Thursday, and they got a referee named Johnny Bravo. How about that? Yeah. It's a conspiracy. It is. Isn't that a cartoon? Yeah. yeah. There's, there's, it seems to be like there's 50 Johnny Bravos now. It was time for the Spam Slam of the Week. 
You want to tell your spam story here? You went to Hawaii and had spam? <laughs> That's the whole story. It's disgusting. Come on. Tony asked when the last time I had spam was. I answered his question. Yeah, the answer to that question should always be never. Don't reveal that information. Spam? Disgusting. They do like spam in Hawaii, though. They're big, they're big spam addicts, I've noticed. Everywhere you go, you can add spam. Yeah. Mm, it's weird. Why? Why are you yelling at them and not me? I don't know. I've had it once in the past 30 years. They did everything. No, day. I am yelling at you, not them. Or, yeah, anyway. You're not Hawaiian. Well, no. Yeah. I'm clearly not. You're a poser eating that spam. <laughs> All right, let's get going here. So, the spam slam of the week was Dr. Death doing a press slam, which they didn't actually show. They showed him doing the lift and not the slam. Arn Anderson and Tully... Well, the slam's the easy part. The lift is the difficult That's part. actually true. Yeah. <laughs> Gravity will take care of the rest. Yeah. Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard versus Rocky King and Chance McQuaid. Horseman won quickly. Spine buster, slingshot, suplex, pin. And then it was time for, for the real important stuff in this show. Oh, man. No subtlety here. No. None. All the horsemen are out there. Tully, Arn, Lex, or Lug, as they called him sometimes. Flair and JJ. Now, everyone else has already talked, so this is all Arn and Tully doing the talking. And Tully goes first, and all Tully does is make fun of the Road Warriors for losing, say they hung, hung their head and walked out, probably went back to the gym to work on their bench press more. And then it's Arn's turn to talk. He says, you know what? There was a time in my life where I didn't have one of these. And he holds up the tag team title belt. He says, I did whatever it took to get, to get these and hold, get one of these back and hold on to it. But now I can't help but notice there's a void in the group. Oh, man. And they cut to Lex, who takes off his sunglasses and listens intently. And I mean, the camera's on him for like a full minute <laughs> as he looks at Arn with a look on his face now, like, are you talking about me, motherfucker? They had this in the wide shot because Lex is standing right behind him. Yeah. They could have stuck with this. You could have still see everything Arn did and everything Lex did. They had, yeah. to, they had to cut to the close-up for that. So Just Arn, in case you were an idiot. <laughs> hey, you never know. You never know. So Arn says there's some people out there who want to be great wrestlers and champions, and there's some people who want to be stars. And they want to go to make commercials. They want to go to Hollywood. And he talks about this for a while, how important it is to be a wrestler and not a star. And he says the horsemen are a well-oiled machine. And sometimes one of those gears goes flying off, and it's up to the rest of us to get that gear back on track. Now, before this can go any farther... Ric Flair steps in. The captain of the team, as he called himself. He notices there's a problem brewing here. I'm going to shut this down right away. And he jumps in and just gives his usual Ric Flair happy pep talk. Yes, he says, we're all in this together. We're all still the best. And he, he re again promises Lex that he'll, he'll get back on track someday, sooner than later. And he gets them all to do the, the, the horseman handshake with all stacked hands and say horseman forever or whatever. But Arn never looks Lex in the eye. Mm. And you're thinking about this, and I, I was thinking about this like as we were recording this show. Lex got into the horsemen by basically sticking his nose in their business. And then uh, to make room for him, they kicked out Arn's uncle or cousin or whatever he was supposed to be. So they kicked out Arn's family to make room for Lex. Yeah. And now here Lex goes. He's the only one of them who drops the ball on the biggest show of the year to their biggest rival. No wonder Arn's pissed. Man, this oh all man. makes sense. But they did do the horseman handshake, and they all left together. It's a slow burn, a slow build. Speaking of slow, Mike Rotundo. Hi, hi, hi. There's lots of guys here who don't have their mind on wrestling. It's going to come back and haunt them. I still think I can out-wrestle anyone I can take their strap. Yeah. Sweet. And then it was time for this main event. <laughs> Holy shit. Mighty Wilbur, Barry Windham, and Ricky Santana. First off, look at these teams. The Mighty Wilbur, Barry Windham, Barry Windham, and Damn. Ricky Santana against Ivan Koloff, the Warlord, and the Barbarian. So, we have not had to see Wilbur doing long competitive matches yet. No, he's doing like an elbow and a splash. He's fucking horrible. Unwatchable. God bless this guy. At one point... He did a big splash, okay? I want you to imagine, let's just say he's 6'4", okay? Okay. It was like he was in a cave that was exactly 6'4", so there was no room whatsoever to go up. He hit the ropes, and he jumped, jumped, but went down. I don't know. How? I don't know. 
Like, I couldn't even figure out the physics of this. Let's not even gloss over how bad he looked hitting the ropes, by the way. It was like he went off a diving board. But you know how you jump on the diving board and it goes up and down? Yeah. It was like when it went down, he jumped. Yeah. Or, not when it went up to propel him. Or it broke. Yeah, it was fucking the weirdest thing I ever saw. So there's awful brawling going on throughout this. Hideous. And Tony's trying to push it as, this is the kind of action you'll see at the bunkhouse stampede. Cancel my order. <laughs> Thank you for the warning. I won't go. So Wilbur's in the corner. Number one, Paul Jones grabs his foot. Wilbur cannot escape. <laughs> He's grabbed his foot with one hand. I like, there was a point here where it was Wilbur and Ivan in the ring. And it's it, it's just miserably bad stuff. But as we have mentioned, Ivan Koloff probably worked with more shitty wrestlers than anyone else. So for him, it's just another day at work. Oh, yeah. But Perry's watching this one across the ring. He just, you, can, you can almost see him just say, fuck this. And he gets in the ring, and he tells Wilbur to leave, and he starts wrestling in his place. Yeah. No tag. No tease of a tag. Nope. Just, just I'm wrestling, you get out. It goes on for a while. There's more awful brawling. A, a chain gets involved. Hey, bunkhouse. We got to plug the bunkhouse stampede, yeah. dude. We got to get a chain in there. We had one minute of competent wrestling. was Barbarian versus Barry Windham. Think about that. It was really, really good. The, the ball bearing in looks, the one minute of competent wrestling in this entire it match. It looks spectacular compared to the rest of this. And then Santana gets a hot tag, and the show goes off the air with a match still in progress. Yeah. What? Well, that was lame. That was horrible. This show went off on a cliff at the end there. It really did. But... All in all, from start to finish, they got a direction. They have new. Everyone has new stuff. Yeah, you watch Great. Raw after a pay per view, and like usually it's just well, we're gonna keep going. Yeah, and we're gonna redo a bunch of matches. Yeah. yeah, this is like the big show's over. <laughs> it's time to build some. We got to plant some seeds first. Yes, but we can also build some new programs, mm -hmm. and we got some new stuff coming, and that's exciting. The only thing that's still going on from the. Uh... From Starcade is the Rock and Roll Express and Midnight Express still hate each other, yeah. which means okay, so we're gonna get those two teams in lots of matches. Great. Well, I mean that'll go on forever anyway. It'll also go on forever. It'll never end. Yeah. So yeah, I enjoyed the show. Yeah, good show and.